access to uh, the uh, there's a tendency in the building at least when we talk about weatherization um, almost everyone thinks you're talking about quote unquote low income weatherization and there's weatherization we do have low income weatherization we also have the outside of that program and the goal of the bill um, is to expand both because it's useful for everyone uh, I'm hoping you can talk about the whole universe of uh, whether we can go on and maybe a bit more. Maybe a little bit beyond. But. <laughs> um, thank you for the record. I'm Richard Fazy with Energy Futures Group, a resident of Starksboro. Um, and so I've got a few slides that I thought would be help sort of organize um, my talking points. I'll talk a little bit about uh, who I am and expound a little bit on Senator Bray's um, mention of my experience in Vermont. Uh, remind us all of our uh, energy and climate goals, a little, little bit of weatherization history and some suggestions about, about what we might do going forward. Um, so I'm on page two. That, so I've been in the energy efficiency uh, industry um, for more than 30 years. We've got a number of certifications and policy program experience work, um, work throughout Vermont and, and actually the US and Canada as well too. Um, before my current position at, um, as a co-owner of, of Energy Futures Group in Heinsberg, I was at Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Um, but I, I also wear a couple other hats too. I'm the chair of the Energy Co-op of Vermont, which is a fuel dealer becoming an energy services company. Um, and hopefully you'll hear from Brian Gray, who's a general manager there at, at some point from a fuel dealer's perspective. But we're trying to figure out what the future of the fuel, um, fuel industry looks like as we transition to doing weatherization, heat pumps, and, and renewables. Um, I'm also on the, the board of the Bill of Performance Professional Association, which is the Trade Association of Home Performance Contractors, the, the market-based market uh, weatherization contractors in the state of Vermont, um, sort of the token non-contractor on that potentially. Um, uh, and, and I also was the chair of the uh, Funding and Finance Committee of the 2012 Thermal Efficiency Task Force. So we've been having this conversation for a long time. And I, I, pulled, I pulled that document out from the date of January 2013, but there were a lot of people that worked out. This, this document calls for $250 million of investment in energy efficiency, and we have not made progress in, in that respect um, in, in that time. So um, I, I, I'm also the chair of the Starksboro Energy Committee, so I'm involved in on, uh, community end of things and a partner in Energy Futures Group. Uh, a little bit about Energy Futures Group on the bottom of the, of the second page, including our, uh, just a reminder of our, well, we did a renovation of a 1850s farmhouse and we now uh, produce all of the energy that we need for the building for the year on solar panels on the roof. So it, it heated with heat pumps and High efficiency, so you can you can do it. You can do it in Vermont. That's a little more. That's a little more extreme than what we're talking about here, which is helping helping existing buildings uh, improve. And um, the top of page three, I'm, I asked the question, why why weatherize our buildings? And I think just as a, a reminder, uh, we're, we're we're doing this for multiple reasons, but certainly climate change is real and and needs to be uh, needs to be addressed. This is this is one effective way of doing so. Every time I hear the governor as well talk about his three priorities, I think how how closely aligned weatherization fits with his grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. And um, on all three fronts, weatherization falls right in, in line with those. And I, I can talk a little bit more about, about how those fit as well. Uh, Vermont's frugal, uh, it's, we're, we're certainly a focus on supporting um, job creation and, and uh, energy contractors. Uh, there's, there are many opportunities for not only keeping money in the state, but, but uh, growing our, our, um, our clean energy industry here as well, too. And then uh, we heard some yesterday about um, the need to meet the state's goals. And, and the bottom of page three, I just have a reminder, I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but I think you're all aware that the, the, the uh, 80,000 home 
goal that was um, uh, to be weatherized by 2020. We're not we're not on track, as Jared Duval suggested yesterday. When that that was put in place in 2008, here we are in 2018, and and we've made. Uh, very little progress towards that. And then we've got the comprehensive energy plans of 1998, 2011, 2016, that all mention weatherization um, and you know, both small weatherization, which I'm sort of considering the market of, of homes, and then capital W weatherization, the low income weatherization program, too, on, on both fronts. Um, there's mention there, Climate Action Committee called about doubling the rate of, of weatherization assistance program activities, uh, Energy Action Network's report that, that uh, we heard about yesterday talks about weatherizing an additional 90,000 homes by 2025 to put us back on track. So. Uh, this is a good question, and you are waiting for you to get to it, but so, um, so we've identified this repeatedly and made much less progress than anyone ever hoped, do you have a, are, are you going to get to an analysis of why we need to make such a, do I have to our goals? Why we have it? Yeah. I can conjecture about why that might be. Um, so um, uh, maybe I'll hit on that in some additional points to move forward. So, um, sorry, Richard. No problem. Good morning. Good morning. Um, on the top of page four, so we again we we got energy energy and climate goals, and 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 then the chart on the bottom of page four we saw um, with um, Jared Duval yesterday talking about where we are currently and where we need to be, um, and I think just the, the point that, that 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 I've now made enough times you'll probably hear it again. We've 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 been talking about this for so long and made so little action um, towards that. And I, mean, I think the bottom line answer to your question, Senator, is we really have not uh, been willing to fund what it takes to make this happen. And it's, I, I think it really boils down to a, a funding commitment. If we're, commi if, if we're, if we're committed to, to weatherization, um, we need to put our money where our mouth is. And, and we haven't been uh, willing to do that as a state. So I think that's sort of the bottom line answer. Um, Can I ask another quick question? Sure. So my understanding for low income weatherization, that challenge is fairly different in that if you don't have money, period, you're not deciding how to spend money. You just need that kind of help in order to have safe, affordable housing. Right? So if you're in uh, the middle income range, it seems so the rate of participation is modest and I think part of what I hope we'll figure out are some of the obstacles of having more people that could afford to do it, maybe with some assistance, maybe some low interest loans, whatever that, the thing that makes it affordable, um, what the obstacles are to having that more attractive to more people. So it's a voluntary program. People are going to need to sign up. I'm not sure we understand fully why people don't sign up. Well, pe people are limited. Yeah, and I think it really is, is a, an, an income-based answer, uh, and, and clearly uh, some sort of approach that that is sliding scale that 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 helps out those who most need it at the lowest income bracket, but 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 um, scales up those with higher incomes probably don't need as much incentive to, to move forward. But those in the middle income area, I think, have been left behind. And, and, we've, and we see a lot of the participants in the market-based programs are those that can afford, that have some discretionary income, uh, perhaps can afford to, um, to, to pay for weatherization improvements, which would have a longer um, perspective, term perspective, than somebody who might be living a paycheck to paycheck or, or not have a lot of savings to put towards this. So, in your work, can you define middle income? I mean, it's it's. I think it's 80 to 120 percent of, of state median income, okay. somewhere in there, and that's where it's. Thank so, in, the, in theory, well, I mean, it's probably actually. Uh, in the low income weatherization program, which is actually the next slide on the top of, mm -hmm. top of page of, of five, um, is really uh, my understanding is it's up to 80% median income and by 
by statute, but in reality, based on the, the resource stamp available, they really are served 60% and, and lower. And, and so you may be on that list for, um, we've been helping some elderly residents in Starksboro um, through the process and, and um, connect the dots there. And uh, if, if you are disabled and elderly and low income, you'll move right up on the list. If you've got some more, uh, if you're not in the, quite in that situation, you may be on the list for a year or more um, at, at that higher than 80%. And I've, others can speak to that better than I can, but I, I think that it's, so in reality, it's probably 60 to 120%, but if, if low income weatherization was more fully funded, they could probably serve more of, of the, the uh, constituents that, that haven't been served historically. I mean, it's my hope that what we do addresses that moves that program all the way to the full 80% threshold so that it can fully serve the population it's designed to serve. And then, then we also do work that helps us up to 80 to 120 as well. What those two look like, uh, is it growing one and then address both, or we're working with multiple partners on them, or to figure out how to do it, not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but to figure out who the right partners are. That's tool, from my point of view, the best tools to help all the actors out there. Uh, so I have some recommendations that hopefully will address that as well, too. Um, so just, to, I, I thought it a, would be a little <coughs> helpful to sort of set the, set the stage or level set what, when we're talking about these, these entities. Uh, it, it really is, I mean, I think we've, we've already begun that conversation here. This, I think about it in sort of two buckets. There's the Low Income Weatherization Assistance Program, or WAP, the capital W. Um, and this, is, this has been in place since the 70s. It really, um, it started its life as a job training effort and, and then turned into a, a, a national program. Um, and, and it's really now sort of attempts to do both, but the focus is more on the energy piece of that. Um, so as we heard yesterday from um, Jeff Wilcox, Vermont receives um, some money from the feds, um, and, and, but the rest of it is raised through um, um, uh, fees on fossil, uh, fossil fuels, oil and propane and uh, natural gas, and that's electricity charge as well, too. Um, so I, I mentioned a long, long uh, prioritized list, um, or waiting list, means that the 60-80% is rarely straight, so we just talked about that. Um, there's also a 3D thermal, um, helps address multifamily um, programs, um, multifamily units as well within, within that program. And then there are the market-based programs. And um, so most of these are Home Performance with Energy Star is sort of the brand name that Efficiency Vermont supports, uh, along with a heat saver loan. There's this um, sort of army of certified building performance institute or BPI contractors that are out there serving, serving that market. Um, and and um, so this is an Efficiency Vermont initiative. It's in place. They've been training and certifying these contractors for, uh, for ages. What's happened, though, over time is that because of the lack of demand, the number of them um, seems to have been declining. It should be growing, really, if, if, if we're trying to meet our goals, and it has been going uh, the, the other way. Um, I think a lot of them hear this from the BPPA board. Uh, they don't, a, a lot of these contractors need some assurance that the market's going to be there so they can staff up, so they can at least keep crews going, and, and they can, <coughs> most of these guys are, guys and gals, are, are, are builders um, uh, that have all offered this service, so they can go back to doing additions or renovations uh, if they don't have to work in the weatherization field. So it's really, um, you know, if, if we're, it, it's hard for them to plan a business with, without a long-term um, perspective and funding to support their business going forward. Um, so on uh, the bottom, page five, I tried to break out some of the funding uh, to, to give us an understanding of where things were coming from and what the numbers look like over the, the past year. So we heard yesterday that the weatherization program, or WAP, did about 900 homes. That's typical, eight to 800 to 1,000 homes a year. Um, about $11 million um, in funding, 10% of that coming from the feds, and 90% uh, raised in Vermont. Um, and then those, those sources are U.S. Department of Energy, and then um, the, the, the um, revenue sources uh, are, are uh, listed out there. Two cents a gallon for oil and propane raises a, a little less than $5 million. 
there's a, a gross receipts tax on natural gas of 0.75% and then half a percent gross receipts tax on, on electric. Um, on the market side of things, that's really all funded through the uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative, REGI and FCM funds, uh, Ford capacity market funds, and that raised about $3.6 million a year. Uh, about 1,000, 1,200 uh, homes or so are, are um, being weatherized through the market. So a total, if you lump both those together, we're at about, about 2,000 homes a year, spending about $15 million. Three quarters of that is from um, uh, WAP activity and about uh, 20, 25% or so on the, on the market side. So I think that's helpful to understand where we are now relative yeah. to, to where, we, where we want to go going forward. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, mean, I haven't seen anything that pulled together all well, that's great. I have seen other things that talk about it, like good to hear it in another way. Right. So, um, top of page six. So, given where we are, what should be done? What do we need to be doing? So, we really need to be doing, if you look at the goals, you look at the EAN projections, we need to be doing about 15,000 homes a year, but we're doing about 2,000. That, that's, that's a significant shortcoming and, and, and a gap. Um, and even, even the, the proposal that, that I'll, I'll suggest don't get us there. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, but I think just understanding if we're, 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 I think we're deceiving ourselves to think that we're going to meet these goals without really taking some, some bigger bites than, than we've been willing to. Um, so in terms of what we need to be doing, ensuring that the WAP funding continues um, and grows, um, this moderate, uh, low moderate income household uh, area that hasn't been fully served, we should figure out a way to to serve them, uh, shore up and grow the existing in infrastructure and capacity. We're not going to be able to, uh, we're going to, it's sort of a lockstep approach with the, if the funding's coming, the industry needs to get ready and they need to sort of work in partnership and there's um, some some job training and some uh, to get the, to get the contractors uh, prepared and, and geared up, but at the same time we need to build market, um, build, build demand for what's out there, so there's a marketing component as well that, that would be important. So. Um, this, this all benefits from economic development, job creation, greenhouse gas reductions, and, and health effects. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. Yeah. And you know, underneath all that, it, it's, you know, there's a theme of being steady and committed for the long haul. I mean, that, right. We had that surge in our money, our air money, and it seemed like you created a boom and bust cycle for weatherization. And then we left some people with a bad taste in their mouth about what kind of commitment was this. Yeah, put money in and then fell back. So I think it would be something that not only brings more money, but also reassures people that we're going to be in, in it for the long haul. Yeah, no, that clearly that's, that's helpful. And then the bottom page six, some, some what else as well, too. And it's just, I, I think it's important to put this on the table to think about. This, this um, there are some successful models that, that are out there. Uh, a couple years ago, we did a we did a pilot program with the Green Mountain Power Seed funding and uh, the Building Performance Professional Association, this is Zero Energy Now, where we worked with 35 existing homes and got them to between and, and between 50 and 100 percent total energy savings. Actually, the average was 79 percent savings. Model we're doing in a study right now to validate uh, how they actually perform. But this is through a combination of weatherization, heat pumps, and solar PV. Uh, guaranteed the savings. Uh, a good sign was that nobody called us back and to, to ask for their uh, savings guarantee claim. So we either did something right uh, or they're too busy to, to pick up the phone and call. But we did if, if we did say that if, if our projections don't, don't live up, call us and, and we will make up the difference. So uh, program, just make sure I understand, were they taking loans? It was a combination. We offered uh, incentives up to $5,000 on top of uh, on top of Efficiency Vermont's um, incentives. And, and customers, these were $40,000 projects, which sound expensive, but the average savings is about $3,500. 
So um, mm. uh, these people were saving a lot of the total energy bill. Uh, most of them did do um, a financing component to that. So they, these are $40,000 projects, 20,000 was solar, typically 10,000 was weatherization, 10,000 was heat pumps. That's sort of how it, how it, how it broke out. Um, and their total bill prior to these are $4,000 a year energy bills sort of thing, and they were saving $3,000, dollars $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $
And then in the following year, let's double it again and, and, and um, move that, or at least add another two cents there and, and make it six cents, um, then, and that would move us up to 4,000 4, homes. Um, that would give some assurance, some ramp up, um, provide the industry to, to prepare and get, get ready for that. Uh, and, and start making some, some more meaningful progress in, in this area. Uh, and then, as we talked about, lock it in for as long as possible before reauthorization so we don't have to, have to be uh, going back uh, and, and having this conversation um, too frequently. Um, the bottom page seven additional uh, uh, um, recommendations, workforce development training, working with potentially Vermont Technical College, uh, the BPPA Trade Association would be very interested in, in working with their members and, and um, um, putting, putting, force, uh, put, putting out their uh, ways to grow the industry. Uh, marketing to let, let the, um, that middle income sector know that resources are available. Uh, mentioned four sliding scale of grants and incentives based on income. Um, so it's really, I don't think there's one size fits all, but there, I think there's some good thinking that's been going on, and you'll probably hear about this from others, about uh, you know, sort of a transition for grants to incentives to loans based on, based on income. Um, it's probably not this committee's or the Senate's um, uh, place to, to dive into the details of that, you know, there's, there, but, but there's a lot of good uh, experience out, out there that I'm sure that Efficiency Vermont and, and others can help put those pieces together. Because we're talking about raising money on, on fuel oil, right? Uh, yes. So what percentage do Vermonters pay on their electric bills to make our electric rates go down and to be more competitive with other states? I Today, what's the percentage? I believe it's between 2 and 3%. Uh, 9%. 9%. 9%. 9%. 9%. 9%. Right. And we've gone from the highest electric rates in New England in the last 20 years to the next to the lowest. And it the fun, I rated the fun last year for other stuff. But we put 9% of our electric bills have been invested in making our homes and businesses and, and whatever more efficient with electricity. And we've gone from the highest in New England to the next to the lowest. What do we spend today to make our, to make our inefficient homes um, more efficient in, in, um, in the use of heating oils? Well, two percentage two, two, two pennies on a two dollar fifty cent gallon uh, gallon of heating fuel is one point two five percent. So it's nine percent versus one point two five. Well, it's just been on about fifteen. No, less and this is a pro less than one. This has got to be less than one. Two cents is yeah. into two and a half doesn't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Point eight. Thank you. Pardon? Math there. Point eight percent, and we wonder why we're not getting anywhere. And, and we're talking about going to 1.6? Yeah. What, what, are we kidding ourselves? I mean, this is, this is preposterous. This is preposterous. You might as well just bundle the money and send it in a truck out of state year after year and give it to the oil industry because that's what we're doing. That's another idea that we're That is a good about. idea, yeah. Right. Brian and I have got <laughs> <Yeah. it>. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is 2018, we have a goal. 19. 19. <laughs> 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 yeah, wow. So I, I guess I could have been I mean, more aggressive we, here. But. Aggressive. <laughs> That's what he was hoping for. Right? Just talking about and you started over with going more aggressive. A pedestrian <laughs> and not crawling on our bellies. Uh, this is. We, we're Vermont. talking like going from 0.8 to 1.6 as is, 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 is a heavy lift, and we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling. The, we have to. The people who deliver trucks of loads of oil have to be laughing at this. I mean, this is preposterous. But we're just looking around to see. I don't see that's not in the room today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's not laughing. She's <laughs> counting. Uh, we're going to try to de-preposterize it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it seems like the money committees need some convincing. 
Sorry. <laughs> We're not going to convince them with telling them they have to look after poor people, because that's all they do. And that it's going to have to be a different movement here. Yeah. It's to be an economic movement or an yeah. affordability movement. We got away We've with got it. enough movement or something. We got away with it on electricity. We sent millions of dollars to Gas Metro, so. Yeah, we'll see why we can't. But it, 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 there, we've got results. We've gone from the top to the next, you know, the next to the lower. Those have been from the bottom to results. almost the bottom. Yeah. And we, we, and, and even when we do you know, stuff like the neighboring stuff, the money that gets spent gets spent here. Yeah, and we not keep, out of state. And we keep driving up the cost for poor people. Highest. You don't want to do something for poor people when it times to do it, stay away from it. Don't complain about helping poor people too when you bring electric bricks down. So you've clearly for discussion for discussion. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, so, <laughs> uh, directing the budget where it, it exists, let's not create anything new. We've got some, some good infrastructure in place and some good experience. Grow the existing programs that are, that are out there. It's really just, as, as we said, initially, this is a funding issue, I'd, I'd say, primarily. Uh, and and uh, I'm glad that H440 is, is part of your bill. So think about building energy rating and, and labeling as part of that. And I, and I just had a, um, I, I think I've made all my points, so I, I think um, I'm done. The, uh, if we have, if we could write a check and have all the money we wanted, I think I, the thing that I'm sensing is going to limit the rate at which we'll make additional progress is the ability to staff up and develop the program and do the outreach. We're going to need more people to do the work. So training is part of what we're going to talk about on Friday to look at how do we build capacity to deliver. Because I, every legislator I think, always feels that there's that pretty shared responsibility pressing on it. Are you putting money into a program where it will be well spent? My goal is that we would fund things better, but we'd also be able to report with confidence that we know we're going to build the capacity in an orderly way so that we're not. Creating a lot of internal friction, so wasting money because we're not ready to accept that much money. Yeah, I, I don't think this is more than enough money that the you know if I've suggested a, a sort of two year ramp up yeah. uh, sounds like Senator McDonald would like that to be more robust or maybe maybe it keeps increasing year over year going forward and I. I, I think that the industry, knowing it's coming and with some assurance, the industry can, can and will respond to that. Well, I have one thought along those lines is you, you have in that. So the bill just starts with a, the most simple thing, yeah. a, a one-time double. But it's an open question now in the committee, like well, how much more? I'm hoping that actually we look at it as a stepwise progression. That would so, be great. If it's a doubling next year and a doubling the year after, then, then we're starting to accelerate. Right. Okay. Great. Any questions for Mr. Payton? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. <coughs> okay. Um, so now I'd like to invite to the table Mr. Costello. Good morning. So we, you went, I'm sorry, I was late because I was with uh, Jeff Spalding and other guarding Southern Vermont. Park. We didn't go through a bill, correct? We did not. Okay. So my only question is, we're not going to have all these folks back to respond to a bill. No. Okay. That was. I mean, it's the our draft is posted to our yeah our web page. Right. Um, and it lays it. So it's it, the thing. We'll we will do a bill walkthrough. We'll schedule council to come in and do that. But for now, we line up people really to talk about the topic more broadly. Okay. And. You know, the things that are in the bill, the draft bill at the moment, are uh, include uh, that building energy labeling yeah. component that we just talked about, and uh, a funding stream that's you know, creating a higher level of funding. And now, I figure out our homework is to figure out how much more funding can we use, how would it get distributed to whom, in order to bring up a level of performance for everybody, whether you're low income or above. Thank you so much, uh, <coughs> Chair Bray. 
and committee members, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Paul Costello, the Executive Director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. I'm here speaking for the Climate Economy Action Team. Um, I'm also the former uh, co-chair of the Governor's Climate Action Committee, Commission. Um, the Climate Economy Action Team came from VCRD's work. We're a leading facilitator at the ground level in Vermont. We're charged by the Federal Farm Bill to, uh, to contribute to state policy around rural development, but also to be a neutral arbiter at the local level, listening to all sides of issues outside of politics, looking at how the best ideas of communities add up, helping communities set priorities for action, connect to state and federal resources, and we work effectively across uh, Republican and Democratic lines. We tend not to take positions on political issues. Instead, we convene leadership around issues that our board thinks are of fundamental importance to the future. We've done that around broadband, around uh, working lands, and now we're doing it around climate action, um, knowing that this is an area that um, has a fundamental uh, uh, place in Vermont's future economic development. We convened the Climate Change Economy Council uh, two years ago, which evaluated the economic opportunities in Vermont taking leadership positions around climate. We've had three major summits with 500 people at each. We've brought major investors and entrepreneurs from across the country to Vermont, including Danny Kennedy, who, who describes the climate economy as the most fundamental opportunity in world history for economic activity. That we're going to see transformational work going forward about vehicular electrification, smart grid development, efficiencies, net zero development, um, entrepreneurism, innovation, creativity, and that fundamental to Vermont's economic prospects is seizing market share, situating ourselves as a destination, and in, in our rural setting, modeling rural renewal in a way that can benefit the entire country and potentially contribute beyond our borders. So, grand idea. Um, we've we've uh, framed out a number of action positions based on that that echo closely with both EAN's prospectus and, and what Richard Fazy just presented in, in terms of um, the range of issues from weatherization to building uh, code uh, and time of sale uh, evaluations and so forth. Um, but I'm here to speak for, for SEAT on one of the two core priorities that they um, have established for um, presentation this year to the legislature, and that's around weatherization, obviously. And have you had an opportunity to see the bill? I have not. Okay. So the Climate Economy Action Team envisions a future where every Vermonter has a comfortable and healthy, affordable place to live. Like the Governor's Commission on Climate Action, it calls for dramatically expanded weatherization to, provide afford to promote affordability, protect the most vulnerable Vermonters while providing jobs and reducing Vermont's carbon impact. The bottom line is that Vermont won't be affordable until Vermont homes are affordable to heat. Vermont's economy will not be affordable unless we reduce the amount of money that we're exporting for oil and for carbon-based fuels and return those dollars to internal economic development and generation. Current resources to meet Vermont's low-income weatherization goals are inadequate. For many low-income re residents, that means cold, and these are people in each Senate district, in every town in Vermont. People are living in colder, older homes that are depreciating. They're looking at burdensome heating costs with adverse health impacts. And there have been studies done that show that addressing weatherization needs, the, the benefits on the health side alone um, would be, provide a positive return on investment in the current amount of weatherization dollars. Jared Duval, Richard Fazy have given you a lot more statistics and current statistics on the number of homes and uh, prospectus on number of homes. Um, we believe that a surge in low-income weatherization investment made today um, reduces fuel needs for future Vermonters for the next generation. So you think of the impact of a year's spending, you have to think about that in terms of a 20-year investment in, in low-income family uh, economies. Making their homes healthier, providing significant economic returns to them in the reduction of their fuel bills, and we believe that Vermont should be doubling its annual investment in weatherization assistance program directly for the most vulnerable Vermonters this year. 
There may be five other steps that you can take, but this is the center of it, protecting the most vulnerable, advancing their affordability for the future. Um, can I ask just a quick yeah. question? So um, I've seen it in the Climate Action Committee report and recommendation. Um, what's the relationship between that commission and the governor's budget? I'm not trying to ask a political question, but I, I'm not seeing a funding stream to match the recommendation. So I don't, I'm trying to figure out how to take the rec It's his own commission, but the budget's not the same. So. Very little in the, gov the Governor's Commission's report is reflected in the Governor's budget calls. Um, <coughs> just want to make sure I wasn't missing a piece. It could be somewhere else in the budget. No, we, we're not privy to the internal <laughs> dialogues that happened around the Commission's report. Um, Weatherization was one issue that was fundamental to that commission, another being EVs, electric vehicle rollout, supporting uh, uh, the reduction of, of use and time of sales tax issue on, on, on EVs, uh, stimulation for lower income people to be able to get into the uh, used EV, used plug-in hybrid market. Um, and there's, there was $1.5 million in the governor's budget towards that. Um, but. But stepping back, this is the work of years. On the other hand, there's not a lot of uh, um, budgetary uh, proposal connected to this. And we're very concerned. We're very concerned that um, we're at a point in history where we need to set trajectory and where uh, the State House seems to have its head down around the costs and, and long-term investments. And we, we deeply appreciate the interest of this committee in weatherization and the importance of taking a, a bold vision and bold action today, and that bold action should hit the budget line. And not how to interpret the head down. Tell me what that means. Focus or not paying attention? In the same. It's better than the other place our heads. We're watching a very <laughs> difficult appropriations conversation on the House side. We're watching House of, uh, transportation, yeah. having a very limited view of the potential for investment. Um, and that's very challenging, I think, from the point of view in terms of our economic right. the economic drive behind this work. Did you have an opportunity to lobby the governor yourself as the chair on these? I had the opportunity to present. You did? Okay. Uh, Senator Rogers. So you, you keep going back to EVs. Um, and I read a report a, a couple of years ago from MIT that said they thought in the near future, other technologies would overtake electric vehicles. Right now, everybody's focused on all electric vehicles, but then I've also read that some of the charging stations we're currently putting in or thinking about putting in may be completely obsolete in a year or two. So have you guys looked into any other emerging technologies? And it's like what they were saying is don't put in the slow charger. Nobody that's traveling is going to use a slow charger. You have to get the next generation charger. It doesn't make any sense to put them in. Are you guys looking at any of this, the future technology, to make sure we're not spending millions of dollars on technology that is going to be obsolete in two years? The engineering around the specifics of slow and fast charging is something you should ask someone with more expertise. I, we're more facilitators of this okay. process than experts in that particular kind of arena. The thing I would say is we shouldn't wait for a comprehensive or a technological solution when we have the potential to make investments today, like weatherization with proven ROI. Uh, I agree, I agree yeah. on that yeah. aspect of it. So the weatherization program is administered by the Agency of Human Services, delivered through the five CAP agencies. There's a proven record of achievement. There's some challenges in building a rollout at scale and doing this um, aggressively. You brought them up. Mr. Chair. Um, but from our point of view, those challenges are management challenges, not policy challenges. In other words, things like building workforce training within the capacity of the uh, CAP agencies to effectively deliver services um, is something that, that CAP agency directors and weatherization directors can work on aggressively um, if there are resources there that allow them to, to do that work. Uh, and so the one of the challenges we see around this is the weatherization conversation 
last year and in previous years, tends to get entwined with management decisions around the challenges of doing it appropriately. And, and those are, are certainly important, but you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You, you have to be pragmatic and you have to recognize the managerial leadership of these institutions that have a great track record of implementation. Um, and and uh, so we're, we very much encourage the support of the existing structure. And we also know that last year there was a, a, a long conversation about the possibility of bonding. We worked closely with Neil Lundeville, who's a member of the Climate Economy Action Team, on that bonding conversation. We know that the complexity of the bonding conversation involved people in thinking about the full range of activities from loans to um, subsidy at different levels to um, low income weatherization. And we're concerned that when we try to evaluate and uh, and build a scope system that's complete for the issue. Um, sometimes it doesn't pass through and we end up having uh, minimal results in terms of the direct work that we could be doing for the most low income Vermonters today. Um, so we, we very much encourage the committee to ensure that there's progress on, on that low income weatherization as a fundamental for this year, knowing that there's a lot more work that needs to happen for the future. Ultimately, the Climate Economy Action Team is are very concerned about the, the systematic work that needs to happen around incentives and in systems change in the building. You know, the RFF study documented the fact that um, a new income stream alone that was, uh, that was a carbon price that set market signals on, on the use of carbon fuels alone would, would have a fairly small effect on the behavior of Vermonters, that it would be a, a, a slow effect and it wouldn't be a transformational effect that would have impact on the scale required by the state energy plan for its fulfillment. That study also documented that investment in, that, that having money for investment would be fundamental to the transformational shift. And you look at what's gone forward in Quebec and other places under WCI and cap and trade systems, um, cap and invest, and you see that that transformational activity comes from the investment side alongside of the income source development. We believe that one way or another, Vermont is going to need to move forward with a systematic framework of action, and that could be delivered and developed pragmatically step by step, or it could be participating and joining a uh, a national or an international structure like that over the future years. Or it could be a homegrown solution that looks at all fuels development. And it is, as Richard Fazy was suggesting, that looks at the gradual increase in the costs of in, in, a, in a surcharge on fuels that, um, that works efficiently together to advance both efficiencies and new generation uh, climate economy, R&D investment, and so forth for the future. So we're, we're in conversation with a, with a number of different groups about the, an appropriate framework for that kind of work. We know that, that this com committee and other committees in the building have been uh, thinking in, around these topics uh, at length, and we'd, we'd <coughs> love to be involved in a dialogue uh, beyond this year around this topic. I know that yeah, I, yesterday, Gary um, was in, um, the, there was a, if we want to meet the Paris goals that the governor signed on to, there were three different tranches of work to do, and weatherization was one piece, and we needed to get to 90,000 90, more homes by 2025, I think it was. But alongside of it were things like uh, high efficiency heat and um, heat pumps. And so weatherization is a great piece of the story, but it, <laughs> there's, there's more to it if we're going to help our housing market well. Yeah. For us, the, and, I, and I believe that this is really central to the, the, you know, the RFF study came out and, and it showed the, the fact that there's a need for investment but didn't describe those investments in any detail. The regulatory assistance project with some support from Richard Fazy and his group um, looked at those investments, and from our perspective, the key things that they pointed to were the same that we were working to advance in Vermont this year, which was weatherization and 
and uh, really driving the EV market. It may not be the final answer, and there are many people who think that public transportation transformation is going to be as important to the future. But today, it seems like the most significant low-hanging fruit in terms of public action and the public good. So as a, as a committee, the Climate Economy Action Team um, uh, has that as its core priority. I, I can submit this testimony that will list the members of the Climate Economy Action Team, or I could share those with you now if, you, if you'd like to know who's on that. Um, if you could just send them in, I know it's a pretty lengthy list. Yeah. Members of the committee to receive the Climate Action Committee report. So I uh, just had a chance to look at those report and the, the appendices recommendations. Great. So it would be great. But if you could send if your report over, we'll make sure it's posted on the committee's yes. we'll do. Uh, I have one quick question. Um, uh, so Mr. Fahey uh, noted that he thought that weatherizing fit into sort of a both governor's frame in terms of of for goals or in terms of growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, protecting the most vulnerable. Um, would you concur that that is a good fit between weatherization and all three of those? I, I would, and I would add that it also um, supports economic opportunity in Vermont, both in terms of job creation in the short run. But the more we say, you know, when you're in economic development, you look at um, you look at how you're exporting dollars and how you're bringing and ge regenerating dollars in the community. And when we're exporting as much as we do for fossil fuels, 90% you know, of that dollar is lost to the Vermont economy rather than recycled within it. So for us, uh, the return on investment in local generation and efficiencies that save money keep those dollars cycling in the, the local economy. In, in rural communities, this is particularly important. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Miller to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, <clears throat> for the record, Johanna Miller, Energy and Climate Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. It's great to follow Paul Costello because while I work for an environmental policy and advocacy organization, I fundamentally believe that as an importer of 100% of the fossil fuels that we use, this a response to getting off the fossil fuels is perhaps the most impactful economic development opportunity this state, this world has ever seen. So I just want to sort of echo and support and appreciate the, the context that the two folks before me have raised. And I want to <clears throat> just provide a little bit more sort of context. I've shared with you some of this in the past about uh, we think about and work on these issues and and really just sort of celebrate the fact that you're talking about weatherization and exploring potentially a much deeper commitment to it. So um, <clears throat> so a big part of my work, I think, as you know, is working at the local level um, with the still growing network of all volunteer energy committees. We were in Bennington not too long ago um, and working with the Bennington County Regional Commission. Now there are several different communities that have not had energy committees that are exploring them from um, Arlington to Shaftesbury, Bennington, Rupert, Powell's looking at You could give us a heads up when you're down there. That would be great. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I just love to court you. Only if there's a camera along. <laughs> um, Senator, I'm going to give you a heads up because. Tonight, I love it. I love tonight it. Tonight we will actually be in um, Island Pond oh, cool. with NVDA, <laughs> um, focusing on again in the northeast in the northeast kingdom. Uh, Brian and I have a meeting tonight. Oh, Sorry, tonight. Well, I, well, I won't be. We're in working on an amendment. To <laughs> but it's it's we're working in partnership with NVDA. <laughs> the goal of starting and, more of these grassroots and a bunch groups, of so. our little communities yeah. do have yes. energy committees and they are doing some great work. They're doing yeah. great work. So. And I just, I put that out there because of the fact that, as you'd heard from, you know, Richard and in general, I just want to say that these communities are really interested yeah. in, like, you know, moving, moving the ball in terms of doing something on climate, in terms of reducing our reliance on those imported fossil fuels, um, in terms of making sure that people live more affordably and all of that stuff. So, um, and just to note, too, that <clears throat> you heard one of the challenges that in terms of the uptake of weatherization is, 
you know, sort of giving people a sense of the value of it and driving demand. And these communities really partner in that. We've done things with various um, partners, including the Button Up Vermont program and partnership with the Utilities Efficiency Vermont, um, Regional <coughs> Planning Commissions. That's a successful annual event um, where we're trying to raise awareness and give people a sense of, you know, how how and why they should be making investments in weatherization. But as you heard, I mean, we have done some really good work there, but we have a long way to go. And that is not um, just um, that is not just an economic issue. That I also just want to say too, to put on the record as the committee of jurisdiction, this is a this is also a climate issue. So I had the privilege of serving with Paul Costello and twenty other. Um, <clears throat> 19 other, including myself, other members of the Governor's Climate Action Commission um, in terms of the recommendations that we made really focusing on the building um, sector, helping Vermonters, um, in particular low-income Vermonters, um, weatherize their homes and reduce their energy reliance and energy consumption was a, a core priority. And that was focused both on the low-income sector, so our recommendation was to double the number of homes Weatherized for low income, we also made a recommendation around increasing our commitment to the to the moderate income tranches, as you heard before, in terms of you know again helping people make this kind of investment. So, you know, I look at this opportunity as, as a, a cost saving strategy. We know that you know low income Vermonters, Vermonters spend a much higher percentage of their incomes on energy. A lot of the stuff that I'm saying that you heard earlier is, is not really news to you, but I just want to underscore because. It is um, a commitment that we have had for a long time and we haven't actually really committed. And that's my hope that in this conversation today and as you continue to explore this issue that we think about and really do make the commitment and think about this as not just the cost of what it will take, um, but look at it as an investment, look at the benefits, all the different things that you've heard articulated in terms of public health, cost, comfort, climate, um, economic opportunities. So. Um, <clears throat> I do just want to spend a moment talking about the, the climate piece of it, too, because as an environmental, um, working for an environmental organization, I do think that that is a crucial component. I mean, so as you know, the Agency of Natural Resources last year put out their greenhouse gas inventory report um, over the course of 2014 and 2015, the two most um, recent years that they analyzed, our greenhouse gas emissions went up 10% in two years. And that is largely in the thermal and the transportation sector. Um, and it is the exact opposite um, direction that we need to be heading. And in part, I think it is because that we, we have not focused as much as we need to in those sectors. It is also in part because that those are largely unregulated sectors. We don't have the levers to pull to really require progress in those sectors uh, like we do in the electric sector. I would say kudos to you. Um, it's not by accident that we have made progress in the electric sector. We're on track in terms of our greenhouse gas emission goals. As um, the good Senator McDonald noted, that commitment, your work, has helped Vermonters save money in the electric sector from you know, transmission deferments, from you know, not having to you know, invest more in generation. So that's a strong commitment. We need to do the same in the unregulated fossil fuel sector, in weatherization, in transportation. That's what you're that's what you're considering. I'm glad for it. And also just to note, <clears throat> on the heels of that ANR report um, came the one of several other big reports last year, which was the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes report. Um, it was, you know, this is the world's leading climate scientists that put a finer point on the what they've been saying for decades, um, which is, we need to be moving off of fossil fuels because humans are driving climate change. It's largely connected to our use of and combustion of fossil fuels. And they noted, quote, without unprecedented action across all sectors of our society, end quote, we will face serious social, economic, and environmental disrup disruption. So they noted to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, of a sort of warming, weirding planet, um, that we need to cut our collective societal consumption of fossil fuels in half by 2030. So 
that obviously will require a dramatic reduction in energy cons consumption and combustion and weatherization as a core strategy in that in, in Vermont. So am I here saying that Vermont is going to solve this challenge alone? No, absolutely not. But we have an obligation to do what we can. We've had you know, a commitment to that in statute, um, tripartisan supported since 2005. We're tracking in the wrong direction. But back to the point of the fact that we import 100% of the fossil fuels that we use, we have a huge opportunity to actually really commit to reducing energy consumption, doing something about <coughs> weatherization, stop the hemorrhaging of the dollars that go out of our state. Uh, as you heard from Jared, as you know, about 78 cents of every dollar drains out of our economy. Keeping those dollars here in the state of Vermont, putting people to work in the weatherization sector, um, in, the, in the efficiency sector more broadly. I mean, again, it's not by accident that the, one of the fastest um, job sectors, the growing job sectors in the state of Vermont is in the clean energy sector. That is, again, by good public policy, is a strategic focus and an interest of Vermonters who are interested in saving energy, doing their part for climate, um, investing in more affordable 21st century energy solutions, all that stuff. So it's, I'm here just to say it's a real opportunity in terms of the conversation that you are exploring in weatherization to really think about this and, and commit to it in the same way as we've committed to progress in the electric sector. So um, I'm not going to highlight some of the things you've already heard in terms of, you know, you heard from the regulatory assistance project. I, I, I believe, um, I do just want to note that one of the things that they, that they came out with in terms of the benefits of weatherization, they, they did say, noting that weatherization has multiple benefits, you've heard and you're aware of those, but they quote, avoiding carbon emissions at better than zero cost. That's what weather, a commitment to weatherization could do for us. So better than zero cost sounds pretty good to me, and, um, and clearly that, <clears throat> In, um, encapsulates some of the other the sort of public health and other non-climate benefits, but that's specific to carbon. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't had a chance to look at Senator Bray's bill, but I do just want to say from what I understand, um, it does seem to respond to what the Governor's Climate Action Commission um, recommended in terms of doubling um, the number of homes weatherized um, looking at both the low income and sector and serving that sector better as well as the moderate income sector. I think that is really important. Um, so thinking about that in terms of um, all the different benefits and really committing to it. I have a long list of benefits here. Many of them you've already heard. I don't necessarily need to revisit them, but it, you know, just to highlight quickly, <clears throat> I do want to underscore that I truly believe that that this is, as as Mr. Fazy said, really a strategy that would get to the governor's goals, which I certainly and I think most of us all share. Protecting the most vulnerable, creating more jobs, putting people to work, um, and really, you know, setting us up for not only like short-term affordability and but also thinking more long term. I mean, getting off of fossil fuels is a, is a strategy, is, is an investment that will make us more energy secure, more energy independent, and um, keep more money here in the state and in people's pockets if we actually do it. So um, I can share some of these sort of stats and, with you, but I just mostly want to sort of support the focus that you are taking on this and recommend and support what I believe Mr. Fazy had, had put forward in terms of um, reauthorizing existing funding sources for um, the low income weatherization program, but then actually setting the stage for really making far more of a commitment. So ramping up our commitment over a couple of years, doubling the you know two cents on existing um, the existing fuel tax, increasing the gross receipts tax by 0.75%, and then doing the same again um, in the ensuing year. So setting the stage for, and using some of those dollars to do workforce development, you know, job training, marketing, engagement, 
um, all of that stuff, which is a fundamental, you know, it's a comprehensive approach, it's a needed approach, it's, we've been talking about this for a very long time. I think it's really a question about are we, are we, are we serious about, you know, thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, are we serious about making a commitment to this and, and really realizing the, the benefits that such a commitment could um, achieve? So it is my hope that you, that we, and I think you would be strongly supported by at least the very strong network of folks that I work with in terms of really <coughs> committing to this, investing in ourselves, investing in the sort of strategies that will, that are, I would say, are 21st century strategies. Like, let's move away from the, the 19th and 20th century and help people become more affordable, you know, have more affordability and energy independence. So, again, I can share some of these stats with you, but you've heard some good testimony already. I'm not going to take your time, but. Um, if you could um, send them to June, mm -hmm. and then we'll get copies, maybe the committee has them, and post them yeah. to our site. Yeah, I will do that. Many of them are pulled directly from the work that we did on the Governor's Climate Action Commission. So um, it may be just a synopsis of what you might get from Mr. Costello. So I've got just a quick little question I'd like to ask people who are interested in climate change. Have you given up flying commercial jets? I don't fly very often. I live here in the lovely uh, city of Montpelier where I walk quite often. Yeah. And, and I just... You know, uh, this is not about, you know, wagging. No, finger. it's not. I totally agree with you on the weatherization stuff. But when we talk about overall climate change <laughs> and, we, and we talk about transportation being a major contributor, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of the people that are in this building advocating for all things Vermont can do still jump on the jet like three or four times a year and are traveling all over the place. And it, it, it I don't fly anywhere very often either. Mm -hmm. The last two times well, I've the fly is because I have a child in the Navy and the only time we get to see him is if we go there. But um, it's just, it's part of being holistic about our approach to climate change. And if we're really serious about changing people's behaviors, we need to look at changing all the behaviors. And I, I totally agree, and I think I did a comparison years ago when we put the uh, windmills up in Lowell and Sheffield, and if we'd have invested just the tax right, dollars, old wounds, just ahead. the tax dollars <laughs> that came from the United States uh, Treasury, our tax dollars, we could have insulated 23,000 Vermonters' homes, mm -hmm. more than doubled the carbon reductions and put Vermonters to work. That's not total investment, that's just the tax dollars. So I'm totally behind putting the money in because when those windmills are obsolete and, and worn out, those homes would have still been insulated and still saving Vermonters over, at the time I did the math, it was over $23 million a year. Mm -hmm. We could have saved Vermonters, kept it in their pocket and stopped all that fuel from coming in. So it's just, it's funny how some people, and, and you're absolutely right, we're, we shouldn't say that one and, and give up on this one, but I think we do, we need to look at I mean, you, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think we need a comprehensive strategy. We need a comprehensive commitment. We need real, like, commitment to thinking about this as an investment. The Governor's Climate Action Commission, we put forward some good, solid recommendations. Unfortunately, several of them don't answer the question of, like, how are you going to make that happen in terms of funding those right. programs? Funding is always so a problem, isn't I, it? It is, and I and I like to look at places like our neighbors to the north, a cold and in part like rural place where they have things like the Western Climate Initiative, which is a carbon pricing program, which is serving them well because it is actually serving as a as a way for them to begin to move make that sort of transformation off of fossil fuels, um, and um, helping people make those kinds of comprehensive. It's not just I mean we're talking about transportation because you're not going to drive your house if your house is weatherized. You, even if you have to go to, you know, Burlington or something like that, you're not, if you're living in Montpelier, you're not driving your house. We need transportation solutions. Mm -hmm. We need thermal solutions. We need electric solutions. So we need to be doing all of the above in the most cost-effective way possible. <coughs> and I look at Quebec where, again, they've done it. It's a really pretty picture. Their GDP is going up, and their greenhouse gas emissions are going down. 
So you're talking to someone who has, for a long time, been thinking about and pushing for putting a price on carbon pollution and using those dollars to fund the non-pricing solutions. So actually looking towards you know, helping people, recognizing that we, again, import fossil fuels, they're, they're dirty, they're finite, and they are volatilely priced. I mean, moving people to actually more affordable, stable, clean options for doing all of the above. So I just, yeah. I just want to say this is not easy. Like we built our civil society on the backs of subsidized, dirty fossil fuels, and getting off of this Don't get me wheel. Um, but this is a start. And to uh, Mr. Fazy's point, I think this is. If you did do what we recommended, I want to just echo support for his recommendation. It's going to be a strong step forward, but still insufficient. Um, but it's my hope too that we can we think about this and we commit to it as a investing in ourselves. Stop framing it only in the cost and the consequences, because um, we clearly want to protect those who can least afford to pay. We want to bring them along in this transition. I work a lot with our community action agencies and our low income partners. The goal is not to penalize or harm rural and low income people, it's to help them. Yeah, and I think this, I mean, I think the whole <coughs> climate thing, I think it was Paul that pointed out, it's a huge, um, it, it, it's a place where innovation could actually help everybody. I mean, there, there's so much potential for new technologies to create new jobs and do a better job at everything that we do. And air travel is a great example. I mean, it, 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 it's such a polluter, and it pollutes air, areas that there aren't cars, such as it goes over the Arctic and drops things mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, what sorts of innovative ways can, or can we incentivize those kinds of developments and, you know, engineering opportunities in this state? The unfortunate like some other states we've, have done. We've given, we did about years ago on rail, unlike some other countries who have great rail systems that travel at high speed, we have old clunky rail systems that travel at low speeds. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's awful. I, that I, breaks down. I, I couldn't agree more. Those are both unfortunate. But you, if, you, if states like the state of Vermont begin to send market signals, People are going to innovate more. They mm -hmm. already yeah. are. Yeah. I mean, but and this is not this is not the, the co this conversation is not only happening here. It is happening, you know, in lots of other states. I just came back from a panel in Michigan where they have asked me to tell, thank you, the success story of what you guys have done in terms of efficiency and take the train out or. Just <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> curious. I actually drove that with my mom. It was a really cute carpool opportunity. Uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, your point is well taken, but I, I just hope that we really begin to look at this yeah. in a different this way. Is and we yeah. should have started. Yeah. So I see that you two are two peas in a pod. Oh yeah. They didn't recognize that before, but I can We're see going up yep. to Island Pod tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the table. Okay. So great. Thank wear you very your, much. Wear your sweater. They don't like burning fossil fuel up there. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite Mr. Zabriski. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, how, long, how much time will we working in here? Just so I don't. Or should I talk until you tell me to stop? <laughs> if we can aim for roughly 20 minutes. Okay. And we'll see how that goes. Great. Um, so, Paul Zabriskie uh, from Capstone Community Action. and. Uh, I have a, a weatherization fact sheet. I pass this around just so I don't forget to hand it out sooner. Um, uh, and, and thanks for coming back because you teased this up a little bit on your first visit with us. Yeah, and I, I'm going to try not to revisit all the territory I've already been down. But just sort of to remind you, I, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, my primary focus is the director of the Weatherization Assistance Program at Capstone Community Action. So that is, that is a low-income WAP, is often hear it called. Um, we also manage 3E Thermal, which is a statewide program that does deep energy retrofit of apartment buildings. So we're really much more involved in the affordable housing rental market 
uh, with 3E Thermal. We are also a contractor in Efficiency Vermont's Home Performance with Energy Star program. So we work in the market rate uh, programs as well. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Building Performance Professionals Association, a trade group of contractors and, and uh, consultants and program implementers, uh, and we run a lot of education programs. So I, my relationship to this industry is really with the boots on the ground and uh, sort of the day-to-day -day operations of it. Um, I think that the point picking up on where the conversation has been is everything we do is cost effective based on the current relatively cheap price of energy. Right? So, so we run programs that all have cost effective models that are based on $2.50 or $2.80 fuel oil, oil or equivalents. Um, everything else that comes along with it comes along for free. The, the health and safety benefits, uh, the, the carbon emissions and, and lots of other emissions that go along with burning fossil fuels. Um, one of the things that we're not doing well as, a, as an industry, and I'm speaking for all of those, is, is the challenge of, of working together on the, the getting people all the way there. So um, one of the questions asked earlier was about uh, the limits to growth. And I, from my perspective, it's all about demand. Right? If there's not demand for services, then there isn't any need for a workforce to fulfill it. And training the workforce without stimulating demand, uh, we've been there. We did that. Um, it, it, it didn't end well. Um, so, so. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So my understanding is that there's a backlog now on the low income weatherization front, and that's without particularly active outreach to potential um, customers, right? Correct. So, uh, okay. Just wanted to so, check. in weatherization, weatherization's demand is actually driven by supply. So, so we don't advertise because if we do, we just fill a waiting list full of people we can't serve. So in the, in the weatherization assistance program, it's all about what's the available resource. We, we operate to the uh, amount of investment money available. Um, and that's currently funded, just to remind you, two cents a gallon on oil, kerosene, and propane, half a percent on electricity, and three quarters of a percent on natural gas. Um, so, uh, but, but going back to sort of a broader understanding of the marketplace, one of the things we don't do in weatherization is we, we have highly trained auditors uh, who go into a home, but we don't walk out with data about whether or not a car charger will fit in that electrical panel, whether a heat pump is suitable for that property, uh, whether the roof is solar oriented, you know, all three things that in the long term, where we want to be with these homes, those are all important pieces of information. And here we're putting a professional in the building, we're collecting a ton of data, we're running all kinds of models, but we're not capturing those three critical pieces, which uh, one of the other hats I wear is I work with Washington Electric Cooperative in their tier three program. And we actually sell them megawatt savings from weatherization and take the money and use it to weatherize more homes. So. Uh, you know, I, I have a pretty good understanding of how Tier 3 works, and, and yet we aren't able to integrate the utilities programs effectively with either weatherization or our home performance program. Home performance program is more of a market-driven piece than, than with weatherization, but there are opportunities for us to do better, but currently we operate within the relatively narrow confines of what's cost effective, right? We put the body in the home and we want them to come out with the data that makes that work cost effective. And can I just make, I, I think, Kathy, so you said the three, three data points you can get that you're not picking up is ability to support heat pumps, uh, solar orientation, and ability to charge should there be an electric vehicle. Is that what is that yeah, yeah. I, I, Yeah, those are, those are the ones okay. that were off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, in other words, the, for the broader suite of things, we'd like to see us adopt. The audit that happens is 
it's suitable for the weatherization work, but it misses an opportunity to capture more data. Yeah. Is that because the program is designed just to do weatherization and it's not, you're not authorized to collect the other data? Largely. The, 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 you know, I don't want to, it's, the jargon would be we're siloed. Right? We're working in our, our world, and the utilities are working in their world. And um, that's not to say that we, you know, we have the institutions we need, um, and, and they're actually high functioning in terms of uh, the WAPs, in terms of efficiency Vermont. Vermont has a great brand uh, that is the state's brand, and, and it is promoting. Um, but there's, there's not, consumers want the value of efficiency, but they don't want to spend the money on it, right? And, and I, I, when we work in transportation, transportation is unique because, in my experience, people sort of turn over the asset every 10 years, mm -hmm. right? So people are constantly spending on, on uh, new technology, new innovation, right? The next car you buy has even better Bluetooth, and it's got whatever, you know? It, it, we're, we're adopting technologies. Um, there's no app for making your house better insulated, right? It, it's, it's a long-term, it takes a, a sizable investment, and it's the kind of investments people make on 50-year cycles, not 10-year cycles. So, so there is reluctance to just jump in. There's a perception that it, efficiency is somebody else's problem. Uh, I think the RFF report characterized it as, as its demand is inelastic, right? That people just figure that they're buying oil and that's what they're going to have to do is they're going to buy oil. They don't see an opportunity to say, I can invest in having a lower you're, cost you're of oil. You're talking about legislators now, right, when you say people. I'm talking about reluctant to invest and spend their time on this. That's, that's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> and the administration, isn't that what you're talking about? I, I'm not picking on any particular persons. I think it's a, it's a broad public, it's just where we are. We, we accept that the house is drafty and cold and don't think, oh, I really could do something about that. And so, you know, very small numbers of people actually do. Um, well, yeah, here's another example of that is uh, from one weekend to the next, I can go to the same gas station. And last weekend it was 249, and the previous weekend it was 234. So it had jumped 15 cents. There were no pitchforks and torches outside the station. No one said anything about a 15 cent increase. But uh, if we talk about a penny or two in the building, it, it causes a, a wave of pushback. Well, I, you know, I understand that, but last uh, time there was a change, there was language added to the bottom of the, the fuel bill that said it's now two cents a gallon that goes towards the energy efficiency weatherization of the exact language. Yeah. It's been on um, there for 30 years, had that? No, it happened, it, it was added, I think, four years ago, three years ago. Oh, yeah. was it? The, the tax? That language was added to the bottom of the bill. So it, be, it took the bill from being uh, essentially invisible to the consumer yeah. to making it visible. Not a word, right? You didn't hear about it, that. Oh. It, right? You heard about it? Plenty of words. Okay. New tax, new tax, new tax. Well, it wasn't a new tax, but, but anyway. Um, yeah. I'll, um, you know, I think, you know, the, the demand is inelastic. The value comes in reinvesting that tax directly back in savings. And I think the RAP report just hammered that point home uh, incredibly effectively. So uh, a quick question then on your point about uh, getting more done while we're, while someone's in the building. Uh, uh, what's a, I'm thinking of, that sets me off to think about, well, what would we do to address that? So do you have any thoughts on how we address that, to break down those silos. Uh, not in the next month, but I mean, like, what course can we set ourselves on to address that for the long Um. Well, I think collecting the how to do it within the context of legislation, I haven't given enough thought to feel like I want to make a specific comment. Okay. Um, well, it's a useful thing for us to be aware of. 
Um, the, the, yeah. Well, well I, I think where it, where it becomes important is is um, I've been working a lot with Efficiency Vermont, thinking about the folks who are above the benefits cliff. There's both a group of people who are weatherization eligible that are in a waiting list that could be there for years. Um, and then there's folks who, who aren't eligible, but they don't have the resources to just do this. And, and so uh, focusing on opportunities for sliding scale incentives where, where folks with the greatest need get a more enhanced incentive than sort of the base. Um, that we provide them with access to some excellent loan products that we already have. The Heat Saver Loan is a superb product. Um, uh, we've had great success with loan guarantees, or uh, not loan guarantees, but performance guarantees, savings guarantees, uh, with the Zero Energy Now program that I think uh, can, can link to that. So if somebody is getting an enhanced incentive and borrowing a, a a portion of the job to pay the contractor that there's a guarantee that the savings will cover their debt service. Um, so, but, but expanding sort of the access, essentially stimulating demand. And I think with that and with, a, a, with support for intentional marketing and workforce development, uh, we can bring a lot more homeowners into the process of, of making these improvements. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is reduce the cost of housing. You know, as, as I look to say, how do, I, how do my kids stay here? It's about making housing affordable, and that includes making those houses comfortable and efficient. Um, and, uh, so often when I hear about reaching uh, high, higher income, uh, the, the non-low income sector, the numbers that get used are 80%, 80 to 120% of average median income. Where does 80 to 120 come from? I, I hear the numbers over and over again, but I don't know what the, why it's not 125 or 150, or do you know where that so, comes from? Uh, uh, I think 80 is a very standard HUD number, and I think 120 is also a HUD number. Is that correct? Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what we've looked at in, in developing this concept for sliding scale is we've worked with our counselors who work with our constituents on challenges around credit. And, and we, we serve a lot of Vermonters who run into problems with credit, whether it be you know, underwater on car loans, credit card issues. So, so we do a lot of budget counseling. And when, when we work with the folks who were sort of in that environment every day working with Vermonters, the, the sliding scale is actually a curve. It, it, it's, it's fairly strong, uh, a high percentage of the job at 80% out to about 90, 95, and then it suddenly starts dropping off very quickly. You get to a point where people have the liquidity in their budget to be able to afford the loan, and you need a much smaller incentive until it sort of uh, levels off at the current level of incentive, which is about 17% of a job currently. So, so you were to do a job, presumably you would see an incentive uh, through the home performance problem, 15 to 20%. It, 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 it's driven by savings, not spending, but that number seems to hold relatively strong. So, so but, but we see this curve um, and uh, I think the steepest part of the curve is just below median income. Um, but, but clearly there's a point at which, you know, below that, people just don't have uh, the income to support taking on additional debt, sizable debt, to do large jobs, and, and that's a barrier. On the workforce development piece, you know, we've I think been rightly concerned with if we're going to step up investment, which I think I hope that's where we end up going. Um, that we just to be sure that we step up the investment in a way that the market can respond in an orderly way. Uh, we're not 
from pushing too fast and causing you know, more, causing problems. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you have a sense of uh, you know one of the things we talked about earlier was well what if we double for next year that's four cents but if we double again the year after that that would be eight cents is that uh, a path you can imagine working on especially given that we're starting at 0.8 percent of, of the cost so uh, in terms of whether or not the industry can grow at that rate yeah. I believe it can but it has to be across all sectors all right weatherization assistance program can't grow at that rate alone um, so it, it, it needs to be stimulating all of the, the income. Not people. What's that? Homes, not people. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it, you know, we just have to be across all markets in order to grow the industry. I think we need that anyway. Um, the, you know, the, the great thing about this investment half of every dollar that goes to weatherization goes to payroll, right? So, so those are all dollars that are staying local. A third of it goes to materials which are predominantly purchased from local businesses, and roughly a sixth of it ends up as, as overheads and administration and, and you know, rent utilities, trucks, blah, blah, blah. But, but the investment itself is stimulating to the local economy, and then the savings it produces just keeps dollars that are currently exported within the economy. So, so all of that, you know, economic activity is is of great value to Vermonters, and it's keeping that investment at home. So you've been close to this work for for years. Um, you know, I, I also feel like. Um, if you could speak some to how you see the program in terms of its impact on the lives of the people you serve. Right? Right. Um, we've heard a lot of that. I mean, no, I appreciate it. I mean, it's just, it, yeah, maybe you're going to say something different than everyone else has said, but. So I have the best job in the world because uh -huh. I get love letters daily right. <laughs> um, from people I don't meet that tell me about how wonderful our crew leaders are, our auditors are, um, and it's not, you know, they are wonderful people, but it's because, you know, we work in the house for two days and after the first night, we show up the next morning and they know it's different. It's, it's our impact is immediate. Um, it has, uh, it, it, it's tangible to people and they're incredibly grateful, and they speak to that, and I get showered with accolades that I don't earn. <laughs> but, if uh, not in the letters we get. You know, I hopefully there's appreciative people out there. Um, I'm grateful for the work you do. I'm, I am thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning. I come to this work from, I'm an ecologist, right? I, I look at a planet where you know vital ecosystem services are failing in every major biome we have a crisis and uh, I know that the tools to address this crisis are before us like I said we don't need a new app we know what we have to do particularly in the residential thermal sector so to be having a serious conversation about it is I'm, I'm thankful to all of you for entertaining me today. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sure over the next three weeks we'll probably have some more questions. Um, but that is the goal, you know, that within three weeks we finish the bill and have it. I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to read it or I'm trying to Well, it will work. Sounds like nobody's right. <laughs> well, just put it you? No, well, yes, because I signed up. Sorry, it's on the website. Thank you. Right. Under weatherization. Okay. Uh, um, so thank you very much. Uh, if there are not any more questions for uh, Mr. Zabriskie right now, we will pause and take a break of 25 minutes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Us. Thank you so for the beat we're on today. We're trying to figure out how to do more weatherization and 
Good speed on the low end of the side, but um, trying to have, for me, uh, the, the piece I know least well is what's sure. going on outside of uh, the low end of the side. Great. So, Abby White, Efficiency Vermont, here to talk about weatherization, and I wanted to frame up for you the system in Vermont and the different actors and how those actors interact with one another. I'm going to talk about the services that we've been providing really on the moderate side. And then what we see in the market, what we know from consumers, and how that information is informing our new <coughs> approach in 2019. So it's a little wide ranging and happy to be interrupted at any point to take questions. So also, this has been um, submitted to Jude, so it's posted. So apologies for the extra paper. But I just, so a bit of grounding, you're all quite familiar with Efficiency Vermont, but just the first slide, you're aware that we're a performance-based energy efficiency utility. Do you founded, have an extra already? Do you have an extra? I have an extra, yes, for Ledge Council. Yes, please. All right, I think that's all the printouts I have right now. Thank you. OK. Um, yes, so we are administered uh, by the EIC, regulated by the Public Utility Commission as an energy efficiency utility, and we provide electric and thermal efficiency services throughout the state, with the exception of the city of Burlington, which is its own energy efficiency utility, um, as is Vermont Gas Systems, who's also here. And we provide those services to homeowners and businesses across uh, all sectors and regions of the state. So the next slide, I, I think it's important at times to zoom out a bit and understand the role that Efficiency Vermont plays in our state and our economy, um, some of which is visible to consumers and some of which is invisible. So if you look at this market adoption curve, this shows really just generally what does it take to bring um, new innovative technology to the state, bring it to scale, um, drive adoption, and then over time sunset that. And our role is really in this first part of the market adoption curve, where we're constantly looking for new technologies, new services, new designs of programs to help consumers change their behavior, whether it's purchasing a, a new product or services or, or doing something different in their home or business. So we're constantly scouting for those services. We're, we're sourcing the products, ensuring that they're optimized for Vermont's climate, Vermont's economy. We're developing the supply chain, so we're helping to ensure that distributors carry those products, that we have contractors who are well-trained to install those products and provide those services. All of this happens before a consumer actually says, yes, I want to engage. So this is all behind the scenes, and this is really essential to driving adoption and to scaling. And that's why I presented it here, because the question that you've been asking is, how do we scale up services? And I think that Efficiency Vermont has been in this business of scaling services, and driving technology adoption for the past 19 years. I think we're, we're poised to, to do that. We have the skills to do that. A quick question on this curve. So depending on the technology we're talking about, are you really covering all the, I mean, if we're talking about energy efficient lighting, have you now talked to everyone from innovators to laggards? Yes, and so that's what, what we do, is once a product becomes mainstream, like the CFL was 10 years ago, and now the LED is today and has been for a couple of years, we remove our involvement from that market, we take move incentives away, because the market has evolved to the point where the price has come down, that's affordable, and then we deploy those resources elsewhere. Exactly. So that's just a bit of background. I want to focus on the next section, um, if you flip, to the statewide weatherization system. So you've heard testimony uh, this morning and last week on where we are and meeting our goal. And this is just a, a visual way of looking at it. It comes from the Department of Public Service in their 2016 report. So it um, doesn't account for 18 and 17. But you can just see here that uh, there's quite a, a gap between where we are, what we've achieved today, which is the blue bar, 
and uh, where we need to get to, which is the gray bar. So, is there a version of that that breaks out the homes weatherized by type of weatherization program that delivers the page? <laughs> he already has. He read really his asked. mind. <laughs> okay, so if you flip the page, <laughs> this should the unnumbered page. I apologize. Ah. No, no numbers. The only page has a number. The numbers are so old fashioned. They <laughs> are. They are. Okay. Um, so if you flip to this page that has the Vermont programs and the pie chart here, this shows you uh, the share of, of work that each of the entities has, has contributed. So again, this only goes through 16. It doesn't capture the last couple years. But you can see here that the biggest um, slice is provided by the weatherization assistance agencies. That looks a little bit less than 50%. You have Efficiency Vermont providing um, 30, roughly 30%. You see the share that Vermont Gas has provided as an energy efficiency utility to, to their customers that are um, customers of natural gas. You see 3E thermal. And then Burlington Electric has, has a bit of a slice. Where is that slice? It's um, yeah. at the top oh, that, there. Oh, that there. OK. Yeah. And what it, is 3E thermal? 3E thermal is, um, Mr. Zabriskie spoke to it. And it's a, a program that provides weatherization services to low-income multifamily. OK. And um, we actually, I'll talk a bit about right. them in a, in a later slide, but there's and how they fit into the picture. The landlord owned? Um, land, is it public and private? Public yeah, public and private. Okay. Yeah. OK, so if you flip to the next slide of how programs interact, um, there's okay. this, I want to walk you through this a bit. So if you see at the top uh, this sliding scale of income level, and you can see that the weatherization assistant agencies and 3E Thermal those serve customers that are uh, less than 80% of adjusted median income. Um, you see on the right here that there's uh, several different providers um, that are serving 100%. So you have Efficiency Vermont, Vermont Gas Systems, you have a bit of Burlington Electric, and then you also know some other utilities are, are, providing, sort of, are providing incentives through Tier 3. I'll say that um, we work very closely with Vermont Gas Systems and all the others to ensure that there's alignment in our programs and in our services so that what somebody is getting in Vermont Gas Territory is wildly different than what they're getting in Efficiency Vermont Territory. So we try to, to line up the way that we're going to market. Efficiency Vermont uh, provides the backbone services of this, really, this entire network. So you see here below, we are we're managing the Efficiency Excellence Network. That is the network of contractors, uh, BPI certified contractors that are trained on how to do this work. We provide, we recruit them, we provide ongoing training and support, and then access to the incentives. We also manage the Heat Saver Loan Program. We'll talk a bit about that more. Um, a lot of marketing and customer engagement. So we provide you know, statewide reach on our outreach and engagement efforts that um, not only serve uh, to drive people into Efficiency Vermont services, but serve to drive them to other services as well. We provide project support and quality assurance. So we go back, we do some um, checking on the projects and see if you know, how they're performing over time, um, certainly support to contractors, and then all of the tracking, verification, reporting that's required by a, a public utility, essentially. And that's, I think, what makes Efficiency Vermont and also Vermont Gas Systems unique in this mix here, the level of uh, regulation and oversight that we have on these dollars is, is, uh, is pretty stringent. Also, you just- playing around with that um, assessment? Whether it's like a rate. Oh gosh, so it's it's part of our just regular. It's it's um. So you know that we're we have a three-year performance period, the demand resources plan, and as part of that, we have different performance indicators embedded in that. Um, because we're electric and thermal, some of those performance indicators are. Uh, driving us to <coughs> the amount of MMBTU that we save. So that's that's really what I'm saying is that we're, and I'll talk about this later, but we're constantly looking at 
the yield and the cost effectiveness of those dollars. And that is something that our regulator is also looking at in ensuring that, uh, we're, re that we're receiving enough benefit for the investment. And so that's, that's really, I think, what you get when you're investing resources in energy efficiency utilities like Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas. Just also want to note here on the slide that Efficiency Vermont provides uh, $1.1 million annually to 3E Thermal to do the multifamily low income weatherization. Those um, savings, we account for those savings as part of our uh, demand resources plan. And then we also work very closely with the weatherization assistance agency so that when they're in homes and there's opportunities for electric efficiency um, upgrades, we're able to go in there and provide that, whether it's through refrigerators or heat pumps, certainly lighting. So we're definitely looking at ways to integrate and leverage our resources. We've been doing that for quite some time, but we're trying to innovate even more. Can I have a quick question on the marketing and customer engagement? So Mr. Bruce was saying that you know, they don't do any accurate outreach because they're on the waiting list. Why disappoint people not doing more outreach? So uh, by the time that part of the answer was uh, if we do more outreach, we'll have a demand that will help drive the program. So do you, how do you balance that? Because I, I was thinking of efficiency Vermont is actually actively trying to drive demand. Yes, <laughs> we're actively trying to drive demand. And so turning, turning people away? I mean, you are, are you limited because? We are, we are limited. Um, I will say that there's, there's a long lead time for projects. Um, a customer will take, it, it's, not, it's not an impulse buy, right? It's not like my refrigerator broke and I need to go buy something or I, I'm, gonna, I'm at the store and I'm gonna pick up some light bulbs. Right, this is, this is something that they decide over a period of time. So we need to be generating a lot of leads to lead to the conversion rates that we want and need. So, so the ongoing promotion and marketing reflects just, just the nature of the sales cycle for weatherization. Yeah. Okay, the one thing I also wanna point out on this chart is the gap. And it's pretty, pretty obvious that there is a gap between 80 to 100. And, and if Mr. Zabriskie may even say it's more like 60 to 100 with, with all the folks that are sitting on the waiting list. And so this, this gap, and again, our services are available to everybody, but <coughs> the services through Efficiency Vermont require a customer match. They're not, it's not a full grant. So somebody has to have an ability to put some money on the table, either through their, you know, through their savings, or through financing, and uh, we know that customers at that 80 to 100 percent really don't have the ability to do that. Adjusted median income. Okay, so it's yeah. of adjusted median yeah. income. Yeah. Or, or area median income. Area median income. Area median income. Area median income. Area median Area adjusted. It does get adjusted. It does get adjusted. Okay. So I want to just flip to the next charts here, talking um, to the thermal budgets and impacts. So the revenue that Efficiency Vermont deploys for weatherization and all thermal activity comes from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and the forward capacity market. And this chart, the blue and the green chart, just shows you how that funding has changed over time. Um, the total amount that this represents is, is roughly $52 million since 2011. Um, it actually goes back to 2009. I, don't, I just didn't have that data to bring to this, this chart here. Uh, and what we've been able to achieve through that is uh, uh, 814,000 MMBTUs and savings and over uh, 209 million in lifetime savings to customers. And I'm sorry. So that 5.2. From the forward capacity market and regional gas funds. Yes. Separate and distinct from the 9% tax. Yes. Which goes exclusively, Not the almost exclusively to uh, electric. replacing electric components and occasionally 
weatherizing of electric heating. Yeah. Rental apartments. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So we're we have there's a separation here. Yes. Many of our constituents don't understand, and many of us think we understand, but it gets fuzzy sometimes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is the portion of Efficiency Vermont's budget that is dedicated to thermal efficiency, process fuel efficiency. Yes. And that's, that's separate and distinct. Yes, that's any church. you know. 10 to 12 percent of our total budget. Yes, yeah, so we're not talking about electric right now. So one of the things I want to know um, is that this source of funding is trending downward, FCM and Reggie, and um, that has to do with the just these are variable sources of revenue based on on auctions. I said New England auction for FCM and, and Reggie is, is the regional greenhouse gas auctions. So your last year is 2017. Do you have to know where you are in the more recently? Um, FCM for Yeah, I actually have that. Okay, so we can wait. I just, just, we're going to get there. Just the lower hanging fruit gets used up the, uh, the auction screen in the last year. Well, as the, as the electric sector cleans, as the electric sector becomes more clean in our region, the revenues from these auctions decline. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing, exactly. Yeah, so, okay. But just to note that that if we're if there's it's a conversation a well about funding, that we can continue to go to. Yes, that well is going to get smaller and smaller. Because success continues. Okay, great. So I want to flip to the next slide, if I may. So 2018 weatherization budget impact. This is how we deployed resources in 2018. So you can see here um, the low income multifamily through 3E. We provide a little bit of weatherization for businesses, not a lot, you can see. Um, moderate income and then heat saver loan. So the total amount of investments in 2018 was 2.3 million. You can see the number of projects completed then in the next column, roughly 200 with 3E, 800 through our moderate income work, which we call home performance with Energy Star. And then you can see over here the savings on the right. So this is, this is what has been in place. These types of programs have been in place for years. And I want to talk a bit about, um, in a future slide, how we're shifting and changing those. But if you flip to the next slide, just the moderate income piece of all of that, um, again, we do roughly 800 projects a year. We deploy the resources through participating contractors that are in our network. Um, Neighbor Works of Western Vermont, who's here, is one of those participating contractors. And it's important to us that um, we serve all areas of the state. I think that we have some gaps in Bennington County and in the Northeast Kingdom, and so we're the ones that are looking to fill those and recruit more contractors into the network. The rough project cost is seven to ten thousand, and the average incentive is is twelve hundred. And um, so we've, I would say, captured the part of the market that has the ability to pay. We have not captured the part of the market that that doesn't have that ability or doesn't want to take out a loan. And so we're looking to evolve our programs and services to, to better serve that segment. So when you say gaps in Bennington and the Northeast Kingdom, how, what's, can you say again a little bit more of what you need to fill those gaps? Well, first of all, we need uh, contractors that are, that are qualified and interested in receiving the extra training and becoming uh, certified as on, under efficiency Vermont, essentially. Is it easy for them to get certified in those areas? I mean, in a geographic areas, or is it just lack of certification possibilities in those geographic regions? Well, we certainly travel around the state, provide okay. trainings everywhere. I think it's just, for them, it's an investment of time mm -hmm. and effort, and if they're, um, you know, constantly doing that evaluation on their own of what am I gonna gain from this? Is there yeah. more business to be had? So the more work that we're all doing to drive demand, as Paul Zabriskie talked about, the more attractive it'll be for contractors to want to go through that process. 
but a lot of the folks that are in our, our network, they're, they're you know, general building contractors. Yeah. And they've just <laughs> diversified their services to do weatherization as well. well can you uh, generalize, I don't know if you can say uh, what it costs to get that training and you will <laughs> Days per all, and does it take a thousand dollar investment in the program? Mm -hmm. Well, all the training is provided by free, uh, free for efficiency Vermont. But Paul, do you have a so, uh, having been certified once upon a time, uh -huh. I would say it is a cash cost of between three thousand and five thousand dollars. Some subsidies to that are available. Uh, it's probably 60 hours. 40 of it around class time, 20 of it around time. Uh, and you know, to, to sort of school a crew, dedicate this work is about $100,000 between truck, equipment, diagnostic equipment, and the, the basic tool needed to, to roll the two. And you guys do it for free, though. Yeah, I mean, we provide our, our efficiency Your excellence efficiency. trainings for free. Yeah, to become BPI certified is is above and beyond that, but, yeah. It was helpful. I mean, it's a uh, significant time. It is. Yeah. It is. So I want to shift a bit and talk about the health impacts of weatherization. This has come up, but I wanted to present some numbers. Uh, there was a research, there was a report done by Ver Vermont Department of Health came out late last year, and so if you haven't seen that report, I definitely recommend a review of it. But one of the key findings is that the 10-year benefits per household that have um, weatherization measures and health measures done on top of that, the, the savings are almost three times the cost. And so this is the analysis that they've shown here. When, I, when you talk about health plus weatherization, you're looking not only at air sealing and insulation and, and all the work that we would be doing and, and for weatherization, but you're looking at mold remediation, um, additional ventilation, um, pest and dust control, accessibility issues, asbestos. So you're going above and beyond. And when you make those investments, you can see here um, in the first year and the 10 year benefits and the, also the, the public benefits as well. I'll note that. Can I ask a quick question? So yeah. Is, these numbers are dedicated on what kind of investment? How, how many dollars in? I, how many dollars out? I believe it was, I think in their report it was $2,000 in. But I can certainly check on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Or I will say, actually, no. Let me let me amend that. That the that the average cost per project is roughly ten thousand dollars, and that the amount of the incentive I think was closer to two thousand. Yeah. Another statistic that um, uh, our staff person who works on this just wanted me to pass along is that the EPA says that six out of ten households are hazardous to human health. So when you think about when you think what about, about that, I mean, is that related to weatherization? Could it be water issues? Yeah, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Six yeah. out of ten in the United States. Yeah. yeah. They should have a pretty good handle on how that happened. Right. So when we talk about air air quality, yeah. indoor air quality is is a, is a, a serious uh, public health issue. Not a, not not just an energy issue. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's just important. I wanted to bring in something to express the non-energy benefits of weatherization. Um, this report has just been released, so it's important to take a look at it. But the non-energy benefits, and I think as somebody else said, uh, far outweigh the energy benefits. We're able to quantify the energy and dollar benefits a lot more specifically than some of these. But and as you tighten up the homes, though, what does it do with radon issues? <clears throat> All of those things need to, if you're looking yeah. at health, you have to right. you have to look at that. And it's one of the reasons that these projects are complex and expensive, mm -hmm. because the home is a, is a, is a living system, mm -hmm. and there's all types of, of chemicals and opportunities yeah. for, for problems in homes. So you end up addressing things like uh, air changes for hours to tighten the home, but that's 
Exactly. Exactly. White House was a lot healthier. Thank you. Well, that. No, I lived in it. Yes, I have some old problems. Yeah. It's one. It's definitely one of the barriers to to market adoption is the complexity. This isn't something that you can just say, you know, go to the store and purchase this off the shelf because every home is different, and you need to ensure that the contractors that are working in the homes really understand the complexity. Mr. Chair, yes, sir. I'm, I'm worried when I see charts like this. Um, Which chart? Are you this one, because it includes how what you save in dollars to you expending for heat, and then it adds up other health numbers in there, which are, are are different dollars. And to the extent that you can differentiate those two, this is what you save from heat. It doesn't cost you the, the checks that you write or the cash you put in an envelope, and then separate the others as being added benefits. It, when you, it just is a tough one for people to digest. Like, wow, those things, I don't know, that's not really money. So it's, right. it's subtle, but it's, in, it's important when you're trying to interface with the public. I think they're going to your point. Part of the real challenge is it's not only the they're avoided costs. They're not a tangible benefit. You did get sick because of something, right? And who, who, you can't see it. So. There's a there's a ton of work that's been done in this area, and I'm just trying to present like the tip of that iceberg. Yeah. And I yeah. definitely encourage testimony testimony from yeah. VDH. Yeah. Thank you. Icebergs are slippery slopes. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So if you flip to the next page, um, project completions, I want to just share with you what we've been able to uh, complete through Efficiency Vermont since 2008 when the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative um, resources started flowing. So you can see a ramp up during um, the ARA time period. And, uh, Neighbor Works was a recipient of our funding, and I'm sure Ludi Biddle can speak to this a, a bit, but they were really able to escalate their work during that. Um, $4 a gallon heating oil makes a difference. <laughs> so you can see there, this, we were being high during that time, and then it, it kind of fell off. Now talking just a bit about the way that we're approaching some of the the barriers to engagement. So these are fairly obvious, but there's data and research to support all of this. Um, upfront cost, contractor availability, and, and skill, awareness of the benefits, and then, as I said, the complexity of weatherization. Uh, we're, we're trying to sell people on getting a root canal, right? right. It, it, you know, it, it'll feel good when it's done, right. but it's, it's it's not a pleasant, pleasant process yeah. to go through. I'm just being honest yeah, about no, it. Right. And part of my job in, within marketing is always trying to figure out, well, how do I make it not seem like a root canal? So it's, I, ask just, I ask myself that every morning before I come into committee. <laughs> oh, I hope not today. I hope today. And, and you, were, okay. you were the reason today. Thanks. <laughs> Less so painful. Glad. Okay. <laughs> And all of our other fabulous businesses. So just a quick bit on the research we have. So we know that customers are interested in making their homes more efficient, and that the reasons why um, replacement of broken equipment and to be more comfortable. So you see here, saving money is a little bit down, cutting energy use. So we have to be mindful that the things that they're looking to achieve and gain are not always monetary or related to the things that we care about, like greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you flip to the next one, um, so many people have improved most of the things that they can or they think that they have, but yet they don't know what's available to them. And this is, this is always surprising to me as, as a person who's trying to get the message out there that we're, we're doing, we're putting a lot of effort behind promotion and awareness and engagement, and still it's something that's not registering for people. Um, there's definitely an awareness gap. We also know that people want to do a lot of the work on their own, so we're figuring out how we can support those mm -hmm. people. And I'm going quickly. Okay. So I want to say, what's, what's new for 2019? 
So we are, if you look on this x-axis here, this is income level going from low to, to moderate to high, and then comprehensiveness of the jobs. We used to, um, I would say primarily our, our areas were, were focused in the home performance with Energy Star, which was a performance-based program. Everybody, you, you get the same incentive. If you reduce by 20% in your low income, at your high income, you get the same incentive. And we're switching that around so that it's much more income based. Mm. So you look at the ways that we're trying to, that we're innovating now, um, working on healthy homes pilots with three different hospitals where we're providing incentives for health plus weatherization. And then we're doing a study to understand the health impacts over the longer period of time so that we can better quantify the health impacts. Is your connection to hospitals that if you, they tell you we have a patient with chronic, or with chronic or with pulmonary disease, that that's someone you ought to reach out to? That's the idea. Yeah, that you target that, that have COPD or asthma, that you go to those places first. And NeighborWorks has done some great work in this as well, and hopefully Ludi will speak to that. Uh, we're also working with Capstone uh, to do, do a pilot to help to reduce the waiting list for customers that are 60 to 80 percent and putting more efficiency Vermont grant dollars on the table in partnership, but also in enabling the, the WAP to provide those services. So I have here, the next line down is the home performance uh, income-based incentives. This is our traditional program again, but we're redesigning it to have a more income-sensitive scale. Uh, we're also now offering rebates for partial jobs, just the attic, just the basement, because we know that customers to, to undertake all of this at one time is a big commitment. As I said here, do it yourself. So we're offering uh, rebates for people that do some of the work themselves, they, they document that, they send that into Efficiency Vermont, we provide um, cash back for that. And then home energy visits, which really there's no savings associated with those, but because of the complexity of the job and the amount of touch points you need to provide to customers, uh, we're scaling up our efforts to be into people's homes and to just walk through and identify, okay, like we're, you know, we're feeling a lot of air infiltration in this one spot. Where in your home are you cold? Okay, let's go and just kind of do a spot check to identify some of the quick and easy things people might be able to do. So it's not an audit, but it's a... It's not an audit, exactly. Because the audit, again, it's a, it's, it, it can scare people yeah. off. Yes. Often they come back with a pretty large price tag. Yeah. And you know, people get sticker shock and walk away. And I also just want to call out that we're working in collaboration with the BBPA, and Richard spoke about this earlier today on the net zero pilot. Okay. This is the next slide just shows how those different programs are going to be funded through 2019. I won't go through the details, but just call out that we're looking to increase our investment in this area. Um, last year, roughly, it was two million. We're looking to go to four million, and that, you know, by shifting things around it in our portfolio. We're gonna, and that's it. Okay. We're going to talk more on Friday about um, ways to finance. But okay. can you say a little something about heat saver loans. Sure. So heat saver loans. You go. I, I neglected to show it, but if you could overlay heat saver loan, it would kind of sit right between low income and moderate income as a way, and we're looking to package up financing with incentives, so it's like turnkey, right? It's when you, similar to when you go buy a car. It's all packaged right there for you and you sign at the kitchen table. So heat saver loan, we offer that as interest as low as 0% over longer periods of time. Um, the process, the, the qualification is is less stringent than what you might get at your bank. So we're able to take people with lower credit ratings, a little bit more risk tolerance. And this is, again, a financing mechanism. But the Reggie and FCM dollars do flow into that to buy down those loans and also accommodate the additional risk. So I don't really know what the, how the money would get there. But if there were more dollars available to you, where would you put them in terms of trying to address that 
80 to 120 or maybe it's the 80 to 100 piece or yep. you know, where, would, where would you assign a few dollars if they were available? So if you flip to the last chart here that just shows where the money is going right now, I would say a few different areas. Um, one is the low income pilots. So enabling uh, efficiency of Vermont to partner with weatherization agencies in service to 60 to 80, putting more money on the table. Those are expensive jobs, so the cost effectiveness of those dollars is not as high when you go to moderate income. So this goes back a bit to, to Paul's point earlier that if we really want to accelerate we have to ensure we're doing it across the entire market, low, moderate, higher income, if we, if we want to get to the numbers. So I think in terms of impact, sure, I would, I would go there. I would also go to um, really just the, the home performance with Energy Star, moderate income, putting more resources there that um, could buy, you could put more incentive on the table up front you could take the average incentive from 1,200 to 2,400. That would move a lot more people. And then put more money into the city <coughs> loan to continue to buy down those investments. So I think all of those things combined, if you have a greater, greater amount of grant paired with low income interest, you know, low interest loans, hopefully get people to the point of no, you know, no investment needed up front or modest investment and that the cost of their loan would be, would be less than their energy costs. Yeah. So you make it you know, yeah. revenue neutral or revenue positive for yeah. them on a month to month right. basis. Great system if you can show them the numbers and convince people that that investment will pay for itself. Yeah, and we've been doing that model with financing with businesses for a long time mm -hmm. now because businesses, that, that matters, right? right. The, the monthly Bottom cash flow. Line. Yep, yep. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank you. All right. So this, Great. This, you know, all of this is over capacity and you know, greenhouse gas. Right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Would you like to invite uh, Ms. Bill to join us at the table? Good morning. Mm -hmm. I say Ms. and Mr. Everything, so. <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm Ludi Bello, Director of Neighbor Works of Western Vermont and the Heat Squad. And um, I did bring testimony. Um, what I'd like to do would be to just read the paragraph that describes what we're asking you all and then actually go back to one of the original questions I heard this morning um, because so much has happened in this, in this meeting room this morning that I think I could just add some um, very specific suggestions. Where are you based, by the way? Are you in Rutland? We're in West Rutland. In West Rutland, yep. right. And we serve Addison, Bennington, and Rutland counties with all our housing services. We're a nonprofit housing organization. And we have programs statewide um, as well, which I'll describe. So we're asking that your committee, the Senate Natural Resources and Energy, support in your bill or in your budget memo, our request to appropriate 1.25 million in one-time funding, either all at once or spread over a five years period for the statewide expansion of the heat squad. And I'll describe the heat squad. But this is so that Vermonters can be served in every county in the way that we've been successful in Rutland County, which I'll describe. Um, and that we could reach a scale where our program will be self-sustaining as well. And I think that's an important thing to mention. What's the, the, the memo that you're referencing here, our budget memo? Um, well, I am not as familiar with your processes, yeah. but if you have a way of recommending our um, Have you been down to or are you going to talk to appropriate? We are in the budget memo for the House. I do know that. and. Um, and we're glad for that, so that may be what, what, what I would refer to. Um, we're just hoping that you'll be willing to appropriate this fund for us. Um, we, we don't, they don't let us get our hands in the checkbook. Yeah, so. I would spend time down there on we, that one. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Yes. 
I know Route 107 quite well. <laughs> so that's our re that's my reason for being here. What I'd like to do. Oh, I'm not sure I understand that reference. You know Route 107. I, was I drive up from right. Rutland to the. I know I'm talking about the Appropriations House. Committee, right? I'm sorry. About the Appropriations yes. Committee. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank sure. you. Okay. Yes, so that's make sure why I, I wasn't being confusing. Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do, um, so you'll have all this, but so many people have brought to your attention the need and, and given you the statistics and some of the history and so forth and so on. So I just thought that I would sort of launch into a story that um, illustrates what I believe you can accomplish by funding the Heat Squad and in particular. Um, and can, and, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just so that people know, so he's you're not one of the five, I can't remember if it's five or six, like Capstone, CDOEO, you're not one of the OEOs, you're uh, a private non well, I don't know if I should say private nonprofit. We that? are. The NeighborWorks is a private nonprofit housing organization founded in 1986, and our mission has always been affordable housing um, throughout. And a few years ago, um, we acknowledged and were very pleased to discover that energy efficiency and weatherization was an immediate um, way to provide affordable housing. In other words, if you drop the cost of heating, um, you help the, the, the households who most need it very quickly. And we received. Sorry, one other quick question. Yeah. Sorry, do you receive state funding currently? We do not. We receive state funding for our housing programs from the from the block grant program not for weatherization. We do not have any state funding right now for our heat squad, which is a specific weatherization effort. And how do you, so how have you been funded? In the past, in um, 2010 until 2014, we had a very generous grant from the Department of Energy um, during the R years. We had four and a half million dollars. And with that, we started the heat squad. Um, the um, we had represented to the app, as an applicant to this program at, at the Department of Energy that we would uh, retrofit a thousand households in Rutland County over a three-year period, and in fact, that comment got a lot of um, giggles, I think, from the grant readers. But they agreed to, to give us the money to see if we could do it. Um, there had been nine retrofits in Rutland County the year before. And you know, over a three-year period, we did, in fact, retrofit 1,000 households in Rutland County. 60% of them were under 120% area median income. So that's pretty significant for Rutland County. Those households, to this every year, are saving about a million dollars, which is like a million-dollar grant to, to the county. To, to, well, thanks. I, before you, I didn't want to step in. No, that's exactly what I wanted to, so to share. Know who you are and how you're guiding, what you're doing compared to. Uh, yes. Uh, so we are not a, we are not a weatherization program, and we deal um, we work most specifically with that group that is not served by the weatherization programs, but uh, up to 120 the moderate income households who need the help as much as anybody. Um, but are not in in line for the um, for the free free services. We um, so you asked um, earlier what are some of the obstacles? Why haven't we progressed faster mm -hmm. at this? And Abby pointed out too that when we had this very generous funding from DOE, there was this significant bump, and we're suggesting that we could have another significant bump with this kind of investment again. What we do. Um, is address the obstacles in, if you will, human behavior. There are a lot of others, financing, whatever, but what we do, because we're a housing organization and we're very familiar with working with these households, the first thing we did was drop the, the audit cost, which is a huge sort of initial barrier. So we dropped the cost to $50, we raised it to 100 and right now it's between 100 and 150 in two places. That is, that's significant. Um, we also explain, so from there we provide this customer service. We explain to our households in very direct labor-intensive outreach 
the science and technology. It's confusing. It's new. Nobody understands why they should have an audit, what it will tell them, what they'll do with it. We help them with that. So basically, our customers have somebody helping them from the very beginning throughout the process. So we explain that. Then we actually do construction management with them. We provide the objective review of the of of the you know what's proposed for their home. We're not going to be earning money on the work done, so we, they can trust us to give them. They will trust us to give them an objective opinion as to what is most important, what's most cost effective for their home. And then we actually. <laughs> You know, we have a lot of busy people who don't get the work done because they're not home. So we can literally be able, we're able to, and I've said this before, let the dog out and let the contractor in. That's the kind of service that will get people over the hump. Steve Costello in Rutland had an audit done five years ago, but he hasn't had the work done because he's never home. And we can overcome those problems for people. And if you do that, you get further along. It's not that we've added so much money to the to the um, to the customer. We've added the assistance to the customer, and particularly the ones who are more challenged to get this work done. So, and then we also um, have we we're able to address other housing issues. Often, people are thinking, "Why should I get the basement?" insulated when I need a roof done and I need electrical and I need all the other work, how will I ever get any of this done and it's overwhelming. Well, the heat squad is able to address all the other ancillary issues or, or important issues in a housing issue. So for example, we do do an assessment of whether solar would be um, appropriate, whether heat pumps would work and we'll do that work as well with them. We have just had a big grant from the um, Agency for Natural Resources to replace wood stoves in Rutland County, which has the worst air quality in the state. Mm -hmm. We've replaced 149 wood stoves with pellet stoves where possible and with more efficient wood stoves. So we, we are a pretty comprehensive look at the home. You heard about some of the health issues that are addressed um, through these um, efficiency measures. We actually have a partnership with the Rutland Hospital, very specific partnership with the Rutland Hospital, where they, where they, um, they refer their asthma COPD patients to us, um, and the nurse and our staff go into the home together and do an assessment of what will actually have an impact on their health, um, and they do go to the top. The, and the hospital has contributed, um, I think it's now up to $9,000 of their funds for our customers to use in these circumstances. So it's a very direct um, partnership with the hospital. 9000 per household or for the whole shoot? Uh, for, for, the, for the households who qualify for, for, this, for this need. They all, I mean, they actually give us funds to do um, handicap ramps, to do uh, handicapped bathrooms, whatever their their client their patients need to get out of the hospital or improve their health health outcomes. It's pretty special. Um, I'm glad to hear it makes sense. Plus, we spend six billion dollars a year on health. It's the same size as the state budget. So, uh, if you're looking for money, I always feel like why not bring health into the whole story? So, glad that, to hear that's right. Team. That's right. And the hospital. When we have, we have these wonderful conversations with the doctors and nurses sitting around the table and, you know, they just say, we've, we've had to keep patients in the hospital because we can't get them back into their home for some physical reason. And we say, well, we can do that for you. And their answer is, where have you been all this time? So we have this, we have this new partnership that is very, very direct. Um, and the um, efficiency measures are, are just one of the tools that we're using. We also, um, when we're in homes, and we feel very strongly about this, we've been in probably 45 to 5,000, 4,500 to 5,000 homes over the years, that we do a full assessment of the home, not just for efficiency measures, but for aging in place, for example. So um, our, our guys are trained to look for the thresholds that are you know, changing from kitchen to dining room or something that could trip somebody up. Or, 
fixing the light fixture on the back porch so that there isn't a dark staircase to fall down, a number of other ways that we, um, and then because we're a housing agency, we can refer people to sources that can help with other, other issues. So it's a pretty comprehensive service and, and a very, um, very direct. <coughs> Can you explain a little um, in terms of the, the notion of a one-time funding grant, either at once or over five years? I'm trying to understand how the money would flow, why it would only be a one-time request. So we ha we've worked with spreadsheets for quite a while to analyze how we can grow our program to serve more parts of the state. And we basically have spreadsheets that <laughs> cover these walls. To, to be, we do earn fees. Since we um, had completed the DOE grant and we were on our own, we've been setting up uh, a system to earn fees from some of our services. We're still dependent on grants, and the NeighborWorks itself has been supporting the heat squad sort of in the interim just to keep it going. Um, but if we get to a volume of business from which we derive fees, we calculate that in about five years, we could be self-sufficient, earning, um, earning on, on our own. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share. It's it's just a model. It's not, but it does have projections as to an increase in the volume of business. All right. Well, thank you. I mean, it's just helpful. Um, and I don't. Jumped in a couple of times to ask questions. I don't know if there's anything else you want to include that you didn't get to yet. I, well, what I want to say that the, the Heat Squad um, did expand from Rutland County to um, Addison, Bennington, Wyndham, and Windsor counties with help from the SEED program at GMP and so forth. And then um, we've actually gotten a grant recently from the Northern Borders to expand into the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, we're serving as well as we can that section of Vermont and this section of Vermont. What we're trying to do is scale back up to the, the level that we achieved very quickly with the DOE funding and, um, and provide, as I've said also in other testimony, Rutland in this case got the big red apple. You know, it got, it got a program that has saved enormous amounts of money for the residents and the residents who need it the most. And of course the carbon and all the other benefits. We'd like this service to be available across the state. So the the Rutland the, the DOA money that would be launched in squad was roughly four million that you used to stand up the program and operate it. That's for right. A lot of four years? Yes. Okay. Um, and oh I did I sh I should also mention that in our sort of one-stop shop model, we also are a lender. Um, we are what's called a CDFI, sort of Community Development Finance Institution. We're um, certified by the U.S. Treasury to receive capital that is to be lent to underserved communities. And your contribution to NeighborWorks would qualify for a one-to-one -one match from the U.S. Treasury for that purpose, which is also important to point out. I always forget to mention this. Um, and we are a lender, so part of the funds that came from DOE, two, two and a half million dollars went into our loan fund, and it has been out, um, uh, you know, in, in loans to, to um, households. We are now part of the Heat Saver program at Efficiency Vermont, so we once again have interest rate buy-down funds to make our loans affordable to, and scaled for the lower and moderate income households. And we've just, sorry, and we've just uh, also been approved by our state treasurer to receive another million dollars um, in loan capital from her five million dollars that was approved last year to um, to capitalize our loan fund. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Murray to join us at the table. He's like this, just switch it up. Mr. Murray, go. 
Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Jerry. You. Uh, I'm Tom Ray with Vermont Gas Systems. I do have a quick uh, presentation I'd like to go through. I am mindful of time. You guys have talked about this a lot, so I will try to be uh, fast. And I have been accused of being Sorry. too, too uh, speedy in these things, but I don't think that won't point. bother you guys at this point. Um, and then a few copies around. For the audience, yeah. Anyone with the, 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 she's got the electronic one as well. All right. um, so, as uh, Abby from uh, Efficiency Vermont had mentioned, we are an efficiency utility at Vermont Gas. We've got 50,000 customers. So, if you are a customer of Vermont Gas in Chittenden, Franklin, or Addison County, um, if you want to have your home insulated or you want to embark down that path, uh, we're, the, we're the entity that will provide that. We work closely with EVT, and basically they do the electric efficiency measures. We do the thermal efficiency measures, and we partner on a bunch of different opportunities. We've been doing it for a long time. About $48, $40 million of investment we've made over those years, a lot, a lot of installations. That includes rebates on equipment and, and insulating homes. Um, when you add up all those savings, it's over 300,000 metric tons of uh, carbon reductions uh, for, for the market. It's pretty, pretty significant. Um, you know, the next slide, real quickly, is this house slide, which really is a powerful story, and it's, it kind of culminates on a lot of the stuff uh, that we've talked about today. But the power of energy efficiency uh, with uh, kind of a, a bundle of measures. So, if you convert from oil to natural gas, you reduce your your carbon emissions by 23 percent because natural gas is cleaner than oil. If you uh, replace your equipment with a natural gas high efficiency system, typically your oil, oil, oil one was at 70, 75% efficiency, high efficiency natural gas is at 95%. So you're gaining 20% efficiency. Insulate your home, on average you can save upwards of 20 or even more percent on in your home. Even things as small as a small thermostat. So what we like to say is we have our customers on a pathway to uh, reaching the 2030 uh, goals in the energy plan by reducing carbon by 40%. And frankly, we we're well on our way to the, to the 2050 goals. Um, and I haven't even talked about the costs here. I was just talking about carbon there. But if you look at the cost in that other column, it's significant savings. So you can get all these benefits and actually have a reduction in your overall cost. So it's a, it's a compelling story. And really, that kind of sums up a lot of what we do. The rest of the stuff, again, I said I was going to be. Uh, quick question. Yep. So on, uh, on the natural gas conversion, carbon emissions down 23%. That's a burner tip. That's a burner tip number. Right? number. That's the EPA number that's a burner tip. Yep. And, uh, um, the uh, just quickly uh, rundown. We're a little different than some of the other efficiency providers. You know, we actually have an, our own team of auditors. Um, so we actually, when you call us up, we send out one of our folks. Uh, they will do a blower door test. This for you know, this is a blower door unit here, uh, and they'll give you a full audit report. These are all uh, much like with Paul's team. You know, BPI certified, uh, long-term experience auditors. They'll give you a full report with the list of measures you can do. Um, and uh, if you want to move forward, you can move forward on your own, and, and we'll give you the incentives and help you finance it. If you want to have us do what we call fast track, we'll actually help you get the contractors and line it up and really project manage it for customer. That's been very successful, because I think many of you folks know uh, just delivering the audit is just one thing, but actually getting somebody to move forward with the full project. So we, we encourage people to embrace that. Our, our grants or incentives are, uh, they can be upwards of 50% on a project. So if you've got a, a $10,000 project, you can get potentially upwards of $5,000, depending on the, how, how much of that screens. Um, and uh, uh, for, for low income folks, we actually work with the WAP programs in uh, the CBOEO folks. So uh, WAP will fund, 50% uh, out of the WAP funding will actually fund the other 50%. So for that customer in Chittenden County, they can get a free weatherization job. Um, we also offer zero interest financing. Uh, we have different programs slightly for single family, multifamily, um, and uh, mobile homes. Each one of those is a little different. Condos and mobile homes are a little different because because they're low energy, they're tough to screen. So we have specific, specific packages really designed for those that are much more prescriptive. Say, look, you can get X hundred dollars to insulate your condo, and it's 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 easier and it's simpler and it moves forward. And, and on the home, mobile home one, we actually have a pretty comprehensive program to tighten up a whole mobile home, just because it's a it's a uh, we know in many cases those folks are uh, economically challenged and whatever we do to help those folks out. Um, offer equipment high efficiency rebates, 
On the commercial side, again, I, I, I'm sticking to my fast uh, promise here. Uh, commercial programs, uh, those are much more customized. We do offer uh, some uh, you know, prescriptive set rebates, but really the businesses, each one of them is unique. We have a couple of uh, engineers that go out and work with businesses, much like EVT does, and we work hand in glove with EVT on these customers. How can we save these businesses uh, on their energy, and really how can we operate them to be more efficient just to operation. And the businesses are certainly interested in savings, but if you can show them uh, efficiencies, you know, for example, converting from uh, oil to natural gas is it's a much cleaner burning, so basically the, uh, the maintenance on their equipment is much, uh, much less and things like that. Um, I, I gave you one example. One thing that I think we talked a little bit in this committee last year was our renewable natural gas offering. But this is kind of a neat example. So we're the first gas utility in the country that sells renewable natural gas. We're getting it from a landfill in Quebec. We've got a project in uh, near Middlebury that's going to be a farm digester that's going to take biogas and clean it up and inject it in our system. Um, that's a, pr a pretty cool area for us. Um, but the, uh, so that's, that's a, we've been selling that for about a year now, and we've got a couple other supply contracts we're gonna bring in renewable natural gas. We're working on projects in, Will in Chittenden County and in and Franklin County to also have digesters that'll create renewable natural gas. Um, How can the, Vermont Coffee say they're 100% renewable coffee? Well, it's the, it's, their, it's, their, ener it's their energy. So they've got 100% cow power, so they're paying for all their electricity, they're paying for cow power, uh -huh. and then all of their natural gas, they're getting 100% renewable natural gas from our program. So um, it's, it's kind of a neat thing. I, the best part of the story that ties to efficiency is when they converted natural gas, they upgraded their roasters to high efficiency roasters, so they save uh, Seventy-five percent on their energy cost because natural gas is cheaper and the high efficiency. So they had a windfall, if you will. Where and do they get their beans from? Uh, they get them from, I think, South America. But I have to I'd have to check on that. Yeah. And it, I, I should have. Put, I was going to put energy on this. The, the mm -hmm. claim is it's one hundred percent renewable energy produced. Basically, I don't know what. What do the, they advertise as? You know? It's it's that's with his claim is that he's got. You know, we believe me. I've worked with them on the documentation because one of the things you want to do in the in the uh, in the merchandising sector is you don't want to misrepresent. You've got to you've got to be very accurate about what you right. say in that regard. It's yeah. no different than Burlington complete claiming to be a hundred percent renewable. Yeah. So again, I we uh, might have yeah, we might have him in. Yeah, he'd love yeah. to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. he'd love to talk yeah. about it. He's he's been uh, so he got a, a you know if you obviously know Paul obviously uh, Ralston who is it uh, Paul Ralston who is a representative for oh yeah yeah and yeah. so Paul's. Uh, um, he's been a real uh, advocate for this, and uh, really, it's it, and it's renewable natural gas is one piece of it, but just the concept of taking your savings and right. investing them, if you can, mind you, not your average homeowner can't do this, but investing them in something innovative. In his case, it was. But he you know, says 100% renewable coffee. Well, uh, I yeah. said that. No, okay. it's renewable energy. Like, yeah, what does it have in his bag? I think it I, says coffee. Yeah, yeah well, I'd have to check on that. But my, my point is. We'll have the AG that. look into I'll, it. I'll send you yeah, that. Right. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> that. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick list of partnerships, and I can just wrap up. You know, we're working with all these players around here, almost people in this room, basically, to be more efficient. Working with Paul Costello in his energy economy effort. Uh, BED, we got a BED, we have a great relationship with Burlington Electric, and we're doing a bunch of stuff with them uh, around. Uh, uh, we call Champ, which is this brand that we do a bunch of. Each year, we try to pick off some efficiency uh, project to kick off around the Champ brand. Net Zero, Burlington wants to be Net Zero by 2030. How can we help them get there? The Climate Action Committee, we're working with uh, on this moderate income group that's come up several times, the 80 to 120. How can we dig in on that group? We've got a little bit of an incentive that's going to kick off soon around that, uh, but more work needs to be done in that sector. This is where we're at step one in a, in a journey to really dive into that sector. We work with the, the WAP, CBOEO, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we're working on this digester I mentioned. So uh, a lot of cool projects out there, and, and we're excited to be a member of this, uh, this uh, efficiency community. So that's all I had. How did I do? Great. Thanks. You did really well. What's a virtual uh, smart thermostat? Just uh, it's Virtual Peaker is the company we're working with, and so they, they actually, so what we, uh, we've got a pilot going where we'll give our customers a smart thermostat. What does it do? Oh, it's, uh, so a smart thermostat, like a Nest thermostat or an Ecobee, uh, is a, uh, it's a, it's a smart thermostat that is uh, hooked to the internet. Well, what it is, basically, it, 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 do? it you can, you can set it for different times, basically like the old uh, programmable thermostat, but it actually learns, basically, so it'll know that you came home at 5 o'clock 
and it'll know that you leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it'll actually start to again, dial back your eating during those periods, basically. So when they say smart, it's learning, but it's also connected to the, the web and mobile apps. So you can go look and say, wow, my house is at 60 degrees. I'm headed home. I want to turn it up. So it, it's fully integrated there in that regard. Um, and so we're working on uh, those, those programs, like GMP and others, to disprove it. So we have, thank you very much, Mr. Murray. Uh, we have 15 more, we're switched our schedule a little. Thank so we have 15 minutes for Mr. Rankin to bat clean up on the, this morning's tour of it. We do. And then we'll take up S55 possible amendment in our last 15 minutes. Thanks. Sorry about the phone noise. I thought my library was on. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to, to testify, and it's going to be a real challenge um, to simply summarize and, and not, uh, not go over um, what my predecessor witnesses have, uh, have said. But um, let me just well, start can I introducing. Jump in and a suggestion. I mean, we've heard all the things we've heard. What have, what have we not heard that we should be thinking about if we try to build a strong? Sure. Um, I mean, I'll, let me let me summarize also because you've yeah. heard a lot of different testimony in, uh, in different areas. But uh, first, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Eric Monk. I'm here representing the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, uh, as well as the Vermont Community Action Partnership. The Community Action Partnership is made up of the uh, five community action agencies um, and their, their uh, directors. Um, the Affordable Housing Coalition, for folks who are not familiar with, uh, it is a statewide uh, membership association. We've got approximately 80 members, all the housing nonprofits that uh, build, own, and operate affordable housing around the state are members, uh, as are uh, numerous anti-poverty agencies, homeless shelters, and uh, so forth. Um, just by way of a personal note, I've um, been doing uh, this type of advocacy for the last uh, 20 years. I have been involved in housing and uh, community development issues and homelessness for over 30 years in this at this point. And, uh, in a past lifetime, I used to work in the trades, um, used to actually do uh, um, housing rehab that involved um, energy efficiency back in the 80s and 90s at a different time of the, of the technology. And also, um, just to the Burlington issue, was uh, city councilor when uh, we issued the first uh, energy efficiency bond and uh, decided to try and put Burlington on a path to, uh, uh, to complete 100% uh, renewable, uh, renewables. Um, so obviously, I'm here to uh, support acceleration of uh, low income and moderate income uh, weatherization. Um, our, uh, I will say that our housing uh, folks all build to the highest level of, of, work, of energy efficiency, whether it's uh, Shire, Shire's Housing in Bennington or Addison Community, uh, County Community Trust or um, Rural Edge and uh, Memorial Housing Partnership in the Northeast Kingdom and, and uh, uh, Down Street in, uh, in Central Vermont and Orange County. Um, they do that um, because it's absolutely critical that they lower their costs because of their permanent stewardship obligation, the public funds that are invested uh, in the housing. And just quick, by way of example, um, and our folks work with 3E Thermal, they work with uh, EDT, they work with um, a fit, um, the uh, Low Income Weatherization Assistance project, uh, Programs when, when that is, uh, uh, works with their projects. But by way of example, um, Cathedral Square Corporation, one of our members, built the first net zero multifamily uh, building in the state in Milton. Uh, just went online about uh, two years ago. And then uh, uh, Chair Bray in, in your uh, area in Waltham, uh, they also work with Addison County Community Tr Trust on the, um, first, um, on the Vermont um, that replaced the older uh, defunct mobile home, uh, mobile home park there. Um, so. Uh, you know, our, our affordable housing members have a deep commitment to this. Uh, they care very much, uh, not just about their own bottom line in terms of um, the cost uh, to maintain the housing, but obviously also about um, their low-income constituency. They serve uh, some of the lowest-income uh, Vermonters, and I think we all know that the lowest-income communities are the ones that are um, ultimately the most affected by uh, climate uh, climate change and have the most at stake, uh, as we saw after Irene, with um, the disproportionate impact on mobile home communities, uh, as, uh, as an example. 
uh, for low income Vermonters really are disproportionately affected by, by climate change and that's one of the reasons that uh, our, our coalition has uh, joined a broader coalition of climate advocates to uh, advocate not just for uh, weatherization, uh, accelerated weatherization, but also for a broad uh, climate change uh, agenda. Um, so as I said, we, we do support doubling um, the uh, funding um, for both low and moderate income. Um, I don't know if you folks have seen this particular handout. Um, I'll just pass it around. Um, it summarizes the um, weatherization asks um, that you have heard, um, that you have heard before, uh, but just briefly um, to summarize, uh, you know, weatherization does keep money in our state's economy. Uh, it helps support jobs, grows, uh, grows, grows the economy, keeps the money in state, um, assists the most vulnerable Vermonters, um, obviously reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, helps us to move forward on our state's climate commitments, which we are obviously woefully behind on. Um, there are multiple benefits, as you've heard. Uh, it's not just thermal efficiency, it's housing safety, uh, housing health. Uh, it's a low income health. Uh, Abby talked a little bit about um, some of the health benefits and the health department um, report that she referenced uh, actually put together a really excellent one pager uh, that I'll hand out uh, now. Uh, I think Jeff Wilcox referenced it yesterday but didn't really get a chance to, to talk about it. Um, so this report clearly shows that there are general health benefits, uh, benefits for people's productivity, uh, especially um, upper respiratory health, uh, asthma, cardiovascular, um, uh, looking at the box in the lower hand, uh, right hand uh, portion of, of the handout. Um, and we just find this report incredibly compelling and uh, this fact sheet I think really um, states, highlights well what, what the benefits are. Um, from a health uh, from a health standpoint, um, so I'll also just simply add that um, I don't know if folks um, were uh, saw this in the fall when DPR leading up to the elections uh, did uh, their survey of what are the greatest financial stressors in uh, Vermont uh, the lives of Vermonters. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, about a third of the Vermonters surveyed said housing costs are their greatest financial stressor. Um, property taxes, which we often think of as a huge stressor, and hear that it's a huge stressor, uh, was a distant second with 18% of the respondents. Um, energy is a huge component of that housing cost, and it makes up that financial stressor. Um, so uh, just um, summarized by uh, outlining uh, our, uh, our ask once again, uh, which is first and foremost, um, to reauthorize low income, low income weatherization um, for the weatherization assistance programs, and reauthorize. Oh, re it sunsets uh, June thirtieth. You like really zero? Yeah. Um, you, when, when you worked on this, when the General Assembly restructured the fuel taxes uh, three years ago, it was sun, uh, there was a three year sunset built in. Uh, so it sunsets June thirtieth, uh, twenty nineteen. So first and foremost, our ask is to reauthorize low-income weatherization to protect um, those, thank you, um, those five, uh, five programs. Um, typically, reauthorization has sometimes been three years, sometimes been five years. Uh, this has been around long enough. Uh, we would ask that it be reauthorized permanently, that the sunset simply be removed um, for the low-income component. Um, and as you consider an increase, um, a step, hopefully a step increase, um, that you kind of draw a circle around whatever um, is dedicated to low-income weatherization, um, so that it's clear that uh, certain that the existing, um, the existing fuel taxes, the existing revenues for low-income weatherization are dedicated to uh, the weatherization assistance program, and that any incremental uh, increase um, also clearly be dedicated to them. Um, through the uh, Home Weatherization Assistance Fund, which is a special fund within, uh, within the state's funds. Um, so that's, that's our, our first uh, and foremost ask. The second ask, um, as you heard from uh, Richard Fazy earlier and other uh, witnesses, um, you know, we've worked together uh, to come up with a way to meet 
Uh, the governor's climate change recommendation to double the number of units, it can't just be done by low income weatherization, it needs to be done in concert with moderate income weatherization uh, through uh, Efficiency Vermont, through uh, 3D Thermal, including also through uh, the programs that um, Neighborhoods of Western Vermont um, runs. Um, and our proposal is uh, to increase it, uh, the fuel tax, two cents per gallon, um, next year, and then again, two cents per gallon the following year, and uh, for Vermont gas to go from 0.75% gross receipts tax to 1.5 uh, next year, and then uh, 2.25 um, the year after, which would effectively double uh, what is currently dedicated to low-income weatherization, um, but would then um, distribute that uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat differently uh, in our analysis, um, to get to the uh, 4,000 units uh, per year uh, weatherized, uh, we would see 35% of um, the new, um, new funds, the new revenues, uh, go to low-income uh, weatherization, 40% to the 60 to 120% of median uh, area median income uh, band, um, which I can, I, um, to note of the question earlier, I can address that uh, briefly in a moment. Um, so 40% uh, to more moderate income, 5% uh, to the affordable multifamily housing developments is this assisted through 3E Thermal, and, and most of those are um, the more complex project, uh, projects that uh, our nonprofit members uh, do. 10% uh, for um, existing uh, market rate thermal conversion measures, and uh, up to 10% for workforce development and uh, expanded marketing, especially in uh, rural and, and harder to uh, serve areas and for the uh, more moderate, uh, moderate income band. Um, I'll just briefly uh, address the question of you know, where does the uh, 80 to 120% come from? Uh, generally, that uh, anything below 80% is considered by HUD and in the housing world as um, lower, lower income um, for a variety of federal programs. Um, 80 to 120 percent is generally considered in the housing community, uh, the uh, anti-poverty community, with um, e equal to a more moderate income range. And the state context for that is that um, the governor's um, housing for all revenue bond that you all passed about two years ago that uh, went through VHCB and that is busy being spent in producing affordable housing uh, all over the state. Um, that uh, the governor and the proposal reserved uh, a certain percentage for the 80 to 120 percent ban, and uh, for VHCB's uh, uh, assistance to home ownership, uh, statutory um, their statutory limit is to serve people up to 120 percent. So that's generally where the, the 120 percent uh, standard uh, comes from. Uh, sir, right now. Um, how does it come to pass that in Vermont the law demands electric? Consumers to contribute nine percent of every dollar they spend on electricity to efficiency, and for heating oil, the number is less than one percent. Who's is the legislature responsible for that? Um, I don't really have a clear answer for you, Senator. Well, you've been uh, working I, on this for a long time. I I, I certainly have. And have you? Is it is. Does all the credit go to Mr. Coda or, or what? Um, we'll ask him that. It goes to Vermont Gas. Um, it also goes to, there is an electrical charge. Um, I, one, no, my question is why is the charge on oil so miserly and out of whack? Um, perhaps how much money do we spend out of state to buy oil and we only invest 0.8% to try and? with Vermont homes? It's a trick question. I, I, and, I, I, and, I, 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 I,
I think it's up to the wisdom of the current General Assembly if right. you want to make changes to that. Bingo. Do you have a dog at home? <laughs> I think that's another rhetorical question. <laughs> what happens when you go home after year after year? Thank you very much. Any well, further questions? <laughs> so thank you very much for that um, wrap up on, for this morning. Right. My guess as to how we have such disparate numbers is one was a regulated fuel, it went through a department of PUC process where someone did some cost benefit analysis, saw the wisdom of the, and then the investment, and off we went. But that's not the system underlying this program. So, so Mr. Okay, do we, do we, thank you. will someone refresh us sometime in this discussion? How much money the market spent in cash dollars every year to buy fuel out of state to heat their homes. So, yeah. so regularly, I'm fuels. writing it down. We'll come back to that. I'm okay. sure Mr. Coda can help us with a lot of the data. And uh, if we yeah. didn't have an amendment, <coughs> we would stick to the topic and keep going. Thank you. So, Mitty, uh, <coughs> as you know, for a week we've been passing over S55. Uh, because seems like a toxic bill. Uh, <laughs> they were, what? Seems like a toxic bill. Are they still toxic. passing it over today? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, potentially not, but I'd say I'd say yes because we haven't seen the amendment that uh, grew out of a conversation. So, if you could write some paper, please. Thank you. And. Um, as folks know, I think it's two years ago, it feels like longer. S-103 passed the Senate, went to, passed the House, went to the governor, got veto, and through executive order, the agency committee on uh, chemical management got started. And uh, meanwhile, I think the senators and others stayed interested in doing it statutorily rather than executive order. So we're moving S-55 to do the same thing in essence that S-103 did before, but meanwhile that interagency group was formed, did meet, and so uh, I asked uh, Mr. O'Gady to work with A&R to look at are there things to edit, to just harmonize, so if we build this in statute that we don't have to reappoint everyone, sort of start from scratch, we've acknowledged what's already been done, uh, and go from there. So, uh, at the same time, I asked Deputy Secretary Watt not to uh, include, for the most part, new proposals that we haven't worked with. Um, and we have a proposal of amendment that's here in front of us. It does include some new things, um, and other things are pretty light tune-ups. So if you could take us through them, Mr. Brady, then we at least know what's here. Honestly, my sense is we may not feel well enough equipped to go down this today. Hmm. But if we can at least get a look at what we have. So, uh, the S55 amendment that you have in front of you does three major things. It conforms the interagency committee on chemical management that was proposed in S103 and in S55 as introduced this year to the, exec the membership of the committee and the power of that committee uh, under the executive order uh, number 02-19. Um, in addition, it strikes a requirement, a required report from that interagency committee uh, that was uh, would have been due under S55 as introduced because the uh, executive order interagency committee has already addressed that report um, and submitted their recommendations to the governor. And then the third thing it does, it gives the interagency committee uh, new authority to um, basically accept nominations for review of chemicals for their uh, prevalence in the state, use in the state, risk to people in the state, and to have the interagency <coughs> recommend to the governor and then tangentially to <coughs> you uh, policy and lawmaking changes that would address uh, the management of a particular chemical. So those are the three major things it does. On page one, you'll see the interagency committee is created. Uh, 
its purposes, uh, lines 9 through 15, remain the same. Um, they are unchanged. The membership is largely the same. Um, the, uh, on page 2, line 4, it had previously said the Commissioner of Information and Innovation, or whatever the subsequent uh, entity is designated, it's now Secretary of Digital Services or designee. In addition, I don't believe the governor's interagency has a Secretary of Transportation on it. And so that, that would be um, one additional difference from the executive order. Um, the Citizens Advisory Panel that the interagency committee is required to convene largely remains the same. Some of the um, language is different. Page two, lines eight and nine. The, the agencies wanted to be clear about that the persons on it are available to the committee on an as-needed basis um, to provide the following expertise. And they want, and they were very clear about that one individual with expertise, and that's throughout. <coughs> then they combine some of the membership from S55 as introduced, line 13 and 14, an individual with industrial hygiene or occupational health ex expertise. They were combined, an individual with expertise in human health and environmental risk assessment, that was combined. Um, a new language is on page two, line 17. Uh, you have had an individual with expertise in manufacturing, they have proposed for processes located in Vermont and subject to Vermont record keeping and reporting. Um, page two, um, actually going on to page three. Uh, lines one and two, subdivision H, that's new, one individual associated with the small business located in Vermont. And then lines six and seven, uh, the one individual with expertise in public policy, they added that phrase with a focus on chemical policy. So largely the membership of the Citizens Advisory Panel is the same, some technical tweaks there. <coughs> the, then you get to the authority, additional authority, the duties of the Energy Agency Committee, page three, line 17. You're gonna get to see new subdivisions for five, six, and seven. And this relates to new authority that's being added in a new section. <coughs> that's section 6634. And it is to review nominated chemicals and make recommendations, including proposed legislative or regulatory changes to improve chemical management through changes to chemical record keeping reporting or other requirements. Subdivision five is really about the process that they're gonna engage in for that nomination. They'll have that ability to hold public hearings, take testimony, receive comments, etc. Page four, line four is how they are going to implement those recommendations that come from the 6634 process. They're gonna coordinate with the appropriate agencies to implement the recommendations. And then page four, line seven, they will also have the authority to develop written procedures, guidance, and other resources necessary to carry out the function of the uh, interagency committee. I have a quick question. So there's also a chemical supply concern to children, right? Um, I forget how it's phrased. The Chemicals of High Concern to the Children program is about 66 chemicals and whether or not they are present in a children's product. As you know, that there are, let's just say, 100,000 chemicals um, that could present an environmental or human health risk. So this committee will have jurisdiction over any chemical nominated, um, whereas the working group for chemicals of high concern to children has jurisdiction over 66 or any chemicals added to that list by the Commissioner of Health by rule. So I guess a quick question, I don't want to stop this, but is there any uh, way where we say the same chemical comes up in both bodies, uh, both panels? So how does that get sorted out? Well, you'll see 
in the 6634 process that the that the process involves some, some process. There's a nomination, there's a technical team, then the interagency committee reviews any recommendations from the technical team, then they vote on what those recommendations are, and then they make those recommendations to the governor and the legislature. And then you just saw on their authority, they have to coordinate with appropriate state agencies to implement those recommendations. So I, I, I think there is opportunity throughout that process for coordination with the chemicals of high concern. Working group slash commissioner of health. Commissioner of health is a, a member of this. So I think there's, there should be ample opportunity for coordination. On, on page four, line 16, the date for the report has been changed from January 15th to December 15th. 2020. Um, uh, then you, the, the, also the report is to the governor and makes recommendations regarding actions of the committee to the governor and you get a copy of that report. Um, the report includes uh, a couple of new provisions, lines seven and eight, a summary of identified risk to human health and the environment from reported chemical inventories. Um, and there, there had, uh, on page five, line 12, um, there's the new reference to human health and the environment. So it's, it's largely the same. Um, page five at the end, line 21, you had had a limit of four meetings per year of the interagency committee that has been struck. One thing of note, there is no provision here for compensation of anyone. There has never been. Um, and I just want to note that. Um, so, so moving on, page six, section two, this is the new section which sets out the nomination authority and process. You'll see page six, lines eight through 11, the committee accepts nominations to review a chemical, class of chemicals or grouping of chemicals. That nomination may be made by the committee, a member of the citizens advisory panel or the public. The nomination submitted to the chair on a form developed by the committee and shall include at a minimum and to the extent information is available, the following information. But this is my biggest question. So you're a member of the public, you're authorized to make a nomination, but you now have to submit a form that includes all of this information. The use and risk of adverse exposure information about potential hazards or risks, information related to releases to environmental media, the extent to which the chemical is regulated by the state, the federal government, or other jurisdictions, and any other information the committee determines is necessary. So will a member of the public have all of that information? At what level will they have that information? What is the expectation from the agency on what would be accepted as a nomination and what would not be? That phrase, uh, and to the extent information is available, and is this, I, I'm not sure how someone would, uh, available to whom and with what level of effort we can kind of that. Is that, I mean, that, 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 that's, you know, it's, uh, I think that's part of that whole question. What is the, the standard that the agency will hold people to? And, and submitting a nomination. I mean, the. I think you saw some of that earlier this year in S49 when you're people saying the leachate from landfills has PFAS in it that creates a threat to both groundwater and, and surface water quality. Is that enough? Is that, is that, a, is that enough for a nomination? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, page seven, 
line four, the committee shall determine whether nomination warrants further technical review. They may require additional information and they may prioritize review of nominations, which makes sense. If they get 50 nominations, they're gonna have to prioritize what they're going to do. We need to schedule for you. Yeah, I believe soon as well. I, I do worry that tomorrow we don't have much time on this. And I would say it's a priority over weatherization stuff since this is a crossover issue. Is Friday the last day that this can actually? No, no. Oh, so no. we're we're fine. Uh, I mean, are we fine, but for as long as your leadership says you can. Pass that's what over. I was. Yeah. So, so I don't think it's worth yeah, but it. But to them. Things are long this morning. So we had a, uh, I'll work with Mr. Ruby to schedule time and we'll continue. I don't want to rush something this important. I, I appreciate everyone's uh, concern to get it right. So I can move fast to the rest of it. So if there's the preliminary determination to do the review, they set up a technical team to, to do a technical review. Um, if the technical team determines that there that there should they make recommendations, um, you'll see on page eleven, page nine that the, the the full committee reviews the findings of the technical team, and then the full committee issues its findings. They give the citizen <laughs> advisory panel time to review those findings. And then, if they determine that they're going to make a recommendation on page 10, they approve or deny the recommendation, and, and then they submit that um, copy of that recommendation in a report to the governor and, and the appropriate committees of the General Assembly. The one thing I want to note, I think it's important, section 2A, you can't tell the governor that he can't have his executive order anymore assuming that he has that authority to set that up in the first place, but I'm not gonna get into that. You just say it is the intent of the General Assembly that the interagency committee established by the governor's executive order shall fulfill the powers and duties of this statutory committee, and that the persons appointed as members of the Citizens Advisory Committee of that governor's interagency committee shall continue as members of the Citizens Advisory Committee established by statute. So you, that's your intent. You can't, you can't tell the governor th that the executive order doesn't exist anymore. When there's conflict between statute and executive order, the statute controls, but you just basically conform the statute to the executive order. There's an argument that they can exist at the same time, but you just want to, it's an expression of intent that they will not. Okay. Well, and the goal was, whatever, an orderly transition right. from one to the other. It seems like the discussions suggest well, that it'll be an amicable transition. That raises that. the question of when do you want this to go into effect? It has currently in passage, on passage. Um, so that transition would theoretically be made um, on passage. So I guess we should think about that a little bit. It almost seems as though there should be a little time post uh, signing the law into effect to get just the paperwork and housekeeping done. <coughs> so, uh, all right, so thank you everyone. Thanks for staying over a little. We'll schedule more time. and. Like testimony from interested parties, uh, because none of us have gone through that nomination, this new nomination language until this morning. So I appreciate everyone staying with us. Thank you, and thank you for the love.